Treasury to create social programs. The 18th annual Homeless Veterans Stand Down in Ventura County is this weekend. It is at the California Army National Guard. There will be free food, showers, clothing, haircuts. On Friday only, there will be a court in session to handle minor manners. No one will be arrested. The bus leaves this Friday at 10 o'clock in front of the Veterans War Memorial building at 112 West Cabrillo. It leaves at 10 o'clock. It will make one trip down to Ventura on Friday and one trip back on Sunday. So one trip down on Friday and then one trip back on Sunday. I invite each of you to come down to talk with these soldiers. I invite you down not to make you look good, not to make me look good, not as tinsel on the tree, but to sit and talk with these people, hear their stories, take a check on their mentality, and to talk with the myriad of social service peoples who will be there, the Veterans Administration, the Department of of uh, the Disabled American Veterans, Red Cross, and many others, and to ask them what is going on with homeless veterans. So I ask you to come down not, I ask you to come down for yourself to educate yourself. To the homeless who are still out there who live in fear, anger, and confusion, the time is come to experience the peace that passes all understanding the grace that is our heritage, and the love that is all that is. To all homeless veterans and all veterans, I say and I say it loudly so that all may hear, welcome home, soldier. Welcome home. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Okay, we're moving on to our work session discussion continued from Tuesday night, and Mr. Ledbetter and Ms. Weiss, it's all yours. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, members of the Council. Uh, today's presentation, we're going to focus on uh, density and design. Uh, our agenda, I'd like to provide you a little bit of context in terms of the overall land use picture, uh, focus then on housing a little bit, what our goals are, some of our incentive objectives, the types of housing products that are out there, and then fo focus on the main topic, and that really boils down to how much density, what types of housing do we want to see, and where do you want to see it? And then the last part of it is essentially what it's going to look like. Um, I think most of you know that, you know, the, in terms of the land use element of a general plan, the use designations are really a central key component, and it breaks down into percentages of different types of uses that, uh, that uh, make up the city. Uh, these percentages have remained fairly constant over the last 20 to 30 years. The last real surge in development we saw was in the 70s where it really had a shift on these percentages. But mostly it's about 65% residential now and 9% um, commercial, 9% institutional, a sliver of uh, industrial and about 15% of our parks. Uh, what this means, when you, how does this translate into the patterns? It, planners often think about land use in terms of pa patterns and what that means uh, in terms of the actual uses on the ground uh, as well as how it relates to the, the circulation. And this is something that really, again, hasn't changed much since the 1850s when Salisbury first laid out our downtown street grid. And we had mixed use at that time. Uh, mixed use of commercial and residential was formalized back in the 20s and has continued through our pyramid zoning, um, which we, we have today. So it's really nothing new. We have the downtown core surrounded by our east and west side neighborhoods where our, that's where we have most of our multifamily, and then the single families, and then the open spaces, and then these buffers. And, and what this, when you have patterns like this that are well established, it really creates kind of natural buffers, if you will, of intensity of use, building heights, setbacks, and open space. Each one of these uses, as you get less and less intense, um, 
they 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 become buffers, but they also become important transition areas, and that's one thing that that we'd like you to focus on as we talk about uh, the complexity of density and design as we move forward. This, of course, is our uh, land use map. This is what's being proposed, but again, these are the patterns that haven't changed much in the last 30 years. Uh, you can see from here the open space and institutional, institutional being blue, uh, open space green. And here's our low density residential. So this is your single family uses that uh, consist of almost 50% of our land use categories and, and, and land devoted to residential in the city. Here you see, then we add back in the, the parks and institutional. Here's the medium density residential. This is 12 units per acre. Most people think of this as duplex zoning. That's a more common uh, association with this. And it shows not only the light brown as the formal duplex, but it also shows the areas surrounding uh, Cottage Hospital. Those are proposed to stay at 12 dwelling units per acre. And then some of the outlying um, areas here and here. The next area are, is medium high, and this is essentially our highest density today. This is where you're seeing the 15 to 27, uh, and we're proposing to essentially rename this as the medium high. And it's the, in terms of zoning, this is your, uh, a lot of the R3 and R4 outside of the downtown areas, the lower um, east side, and some of the areas surrounding um, uh, uh, the Upper State Street area. And then a number of the commercial areas, uh, you know, this is one thing that we heard through the upper, uh, the upper State Street process was, hey, we need to hold the densities down uh, on the mountainside to keep the buildings down, to keep the traffic down, uh, so we can preserve those views. And so, you know, it already had the ST SD2 zoning that effectively did that. So n none of that is being proposed to be changed. And a lot of the neighborhood areas, including the Mesa here and out here at Coast Village Road, the, no change is being proposed. Those are, are uh, being held constant at the existing uh, densities. And of course, there's no uh, residentials allowed in this industrial area here. Uh, what we are proposing, though, is to separate it out so it's more consistent with the zoning, and you do have um, the differentiation of the what the zoning now calls for CM zoning, which allows commercial in this particular area right here along Haley uh, Coda. And then finally, the, this is the core of our uh, mixed-use areas, our downtown, and these are the areas that are being proposed for the higher densities. Uh, so that would be the red would be the commercial in the downtown, Milpas, De La Vina, uh, La Cumbre Plaza, and then uh, selected areas, mostly in this downtown area, north of the freeway, because again, that's where you have this grid pattern where you get the most uh, bang for your buck in terms of uh, traffic congestion relief, as well as proximity to uh, commercial services. So there you have it. That's you know just a quick rundown of those again those basic patterns that we've seen for 30 years that really haven't changed, and then some of the minor tweaks that we're proposing here uh, to try and achieve the goals and uh, through uh, incentives. So let focusing now go, starting to ratchet down from the big picture of land use patterns designations. Now let's look a little bit at housing and the specific goals and things that relate directly to density and design. Key goals here are really maintaining the neighborhood character. Again, this is something that has been heard time and again through the process. This is a key value for Santa Barbara and has been since 1964. Uh, protect the existing housing stock. Again, this is a key value that uh, that's continued for decades. Um, and how we have quite a few programs in our housing and redevelopment uh, 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 um, division to, to try and do that and a number of policies in our housing element that uh, uh, seek to protect our existing housing stock. 
Similarly, similarly um, encouraging a range of housing types has also been a core policy and value in our housing element for at least the last two cycles. And now we're focusing even more on workforce housing because we've done uh, such a stellar job. The, the city has, with the help of the RDA, of providing um, uh, the low-income affordable subsidized, what we call the Big A affordable. But it's really the workforce is where the biggest challenge is. And when I say workforce, I mean everything above the, the moderate, moderate to middle income, the, the teachers, the, 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 um, uh, the police, the fire, the hospital workers, even the nurses and doctors themselves. Um, and then finally, uh, looking beyond the sunset of the RDA, this is really a critical, uh, a critical um, fact that we everybody needs to be going into this process with their eyes wide open because it's going to change things radically when the RDA sunsets and we don't have that money to provide any more affordable housing. So that gives you kind of a sense of uh, the bigger goals that that you should keep in mind as we look at these issues of density and design. So as I mentioned, you know, some of these incentives, so why are we looking at, you know, increasing some densities in some locations? You know, what? why are we looking at them? Well, the objectives are really uh, primarily to, to create more rental and employer-based workforce housing units, uh, especially post-RDA, uh, looking at how we can encourage smaller units how we can encourage smaller buildings, and then finally, um, how to locate future growth in the downtown and in selected commercial areas. So these are the objectives. You know, you go from goals to objectives, and th these are the things that, and I hate to use the word, but I will, we try to incentivize um, to get them to uh, happen. So now turning briefly to... Um, what's referred to as the product types of housing, I think it's instructive to understand um, that there, it's not a one-size-fits-all type of housing market. It's not just rental and housing. But in fact, what we've seen over the last 15 years has been predominantly for sale mixed use. That's really where the action's been in Santa Barbara. You know, most of our single family neighborhoods are pretty well built out. You see an infill um, single family going in here and there. You've seen some up in the Mesa, that sort of thing. But mostly it's, the action's been in the commercial districts and in the downtown. Now, as everybody knows, or many people know, uh, Recently, some of those projects have been quite unpopular d due to the size, bulk, and scale. Uh, the other uh, reason that, of, for their unpopularity has been that they're really not meeting our workforce housing needs. You know, these aren't the ones that uh, are affordable to that segment of the population, not the really um, destitute. We've done really well with SROs and transitional housing, but with that workforce, the worker bees, if you will. Um, the other part of it is the, the requisite densities and the inclusionary housing. Um, this has been a constant pull, push and pull. You know, uh, how much is too much density? You know, how much is too much inclusionary? Should we even have inclusionary? You know, these are controversial items with for sale mixed use products, and they continue to be. They've been through throughout this process, and even um, as you, you know, up there between you, these continue to be controversial. <laughs> Then the concept of affordable by design. You often hear that bantied about in terms of uh, types of housing that are built, but a lot of people are very skeptical about that. Will making something s smaller necessarily on its own make it affordable? Hmm, not everybody really is so sure about that. So these, again, uh, these are questions that have been raised through the process and they continue to be raised. However, on the bright side, the positive side, you know, the concept of FARs, form-based coatings, um, these uh, have been uh, very well, these have been very promising. I, I don't want to say very well received because there's some people that don't quite understand them, what they mean and how they'll be implemented. But the idea that you could, you could establish FARs to both achieve primary goals like increased density yet in smaller envelopes seems like a good idea and that it could really work. So this is something that sort of evolved late in the process and we haven't really had time um, to help develop that, that. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on that in a moment in terms of what it really takes. So moving on, uh, for sale, all residential 
projects. Uh, we've been pretty successful in what we refer to <laughs> as the onesies and twosies. And basically that's out in our uh, mixed use, uh, or uh, excuse me, it's out in our uh, multifamily neighborhoods, the, the west side and the east side. And it's taking, you know, old bungalows, for example, and that have, are on big lots and coming in behind them and putting one or two units up to three or f maybe even sometimes four units, but still preserving the original structure in the front. So you maintain the character of the neighborhood, and yet you, you're able to either rent those out or uh, you can even uh, divide them up into condominiums. And we haven't really been able to track that that well in terms of how many of them are currently rentals versus how many of them have been sold as condominiums and that sort of thing. But what we do know is that it amounts to mm, probably close to 25% of our new housing that's been developed. So this is one area that we've been pretty successful at, both in terms of adding a new housing stock, but also housing stock that's compatible and fits Santa Barbara. So, you know, that's really, we feel that's been a success. Um, market rental. Again, you know, some of that, you know, the onesies and twosies have been rental, but not a whole heck of a lot. And what we haven't seen, it's been since the 60s that we've seen big apartment uh, projects. And that's, I won't go into a lot of detail as to why we haven't seen that, but, you know, a lot of it has to do with insurances and that kind of thing and, and, and tax incentives. But the fact of the matter is a lot of those projects, the bigger ones that were developed in the 60s, not many people are too fond of them. A lot of them were, were not quite in the Santa Barbara style. Um, but the fact of the matter is we just haven't seen any of those uh, recently, in the, in especially in the last 10 or 15 years. So again, this is, uh, gives you a sense of, I'm, I'm just running through, through these so you have an idea of kind of what the spectrum is that, that we're dealing with. Employer housing, we've had a couple of good examples of that. Um, uh, Westmont and now Cottage Hospital. So uh, this is something that can be done, that is being done. And, um, you know, it's both uh, rental and for sale. And, again, without getting into a lot of details about how the restrictions work and that kind of thing, um, it, it is a viable thing. It is a viable product that, um, that we've heard from the community that we need to further encourage. And then lastly, what we refer to as the big A, affordable, and that means, and that's contrasted, otherwise, you know, subsidized housing that the, you know, you get either uh, Section 8 stuff or you get um, uh, RDA money and have the, the housing authority pay for it. And that's contrasted with, you know, affordable by design kind of concepts. People characterize that as um, small A, affordable. So that's just to give you a sense of uh, the spectrum and, and kind of the complexity of the different types and needs of, of different housing. So moving on to uh, how much of it, what type and where, um, the Planning Commission has really come forward with a package to try and answer all those questions for you because they, you, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it's really difficult and it doesn't serve you well to just take one thing and look at it in isolation. You've got to look at how everything works together. So uh, what they've, in terms of how much they're proposing, 27 to 45 as the base in selected areas in the, in the commercial, mostly in the commercial in the downtown and then in some selected areas uh, outside of that. And then up to 60 dwelling units per acre for community benefit projects with a supermajority. Uh, the main focus uh, is really this rental and employer housing and, and as an incentive to achieve that objective as well as the housing goal. Um, this is pretty significant to bump it up to 50%. So the question is, you know, where is it appropriate to bump that up to 50% and where do you want it? So again, it gets back to those how much, what type and where. Variable density. Um, again, this is uh, shifting the way we calculate density, uh, you know, going, getting away from the number of bedrooms, which has, uh, in, in a lot of people's opinion, has been a big reason why we've gotten uh, these big uh, luxury units, you know, studio and one bedrooms, uh, and moving to unit sizes, square footages, and trying to encourage as an incentive program to get you get higher densities if you um, create smaller units. And again, you know, there's no guarantee just smaller units by themselves are going to get you the, the uh, affordability you need. So you've got to look at that pretty carefully and say, okay, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to crank up the inclusionary or maybe you're just going to focus your efforts on rental for now, you know, where you know, or the big A, of course, you know, the big A, they, they control it, <laughs> you know, in terms of um, the affordability levels. So um, parking, uh, 1.5 space, maximum unbundling. 
And then uh, building heights, predominantly two to three, uh, with a supermajority for the fourth and then targeted locations in the commercial and the multifamily. So again, this is, a pa this is their package that they're recommending to you t t to move this forward. That we're, these, all, these pieces all work together. So uh, what about some alternatives? Recently we've heard uh, about uh, some other suggestions. Councilman White suggested maybe limiting the high density to the commercial districts instead of those um, uh, f for lack of uh, those are three, the multifamily areas between the commercial and the freeway. And then another concept uh, would be to limit the, re the rental overlay to the commercial and industrial districts and um, not to include the same area that uh, Commissioner, or excuse me, uh, uh, Council White has suggested that we leave out. And I have a couple of maps here to show that. And then finally, some of the housing advocates uh, recently have suggested that, you know, when you look at the average unit density uh, in the high, what uh, is being proposed now for that 27 to 45 is a range of density. So it's an incentive program that starts at 1,000 square foot units on average at 27 dwelling units per acre. But if you go as high as 45 dwelling units per acre, the other high end of it, then your average unit sizes have to be considerably smaller. They have to be 600 square feet. And this seems to work very well for rental housing. But what the, the housers are telling us is, hmm, doesn't work so great for, um, uh, for for sale condominiums. And what we really need is to m keep constant with that thousand square foot average so we can get the two bath, um, two bath, two bedrooms kind of units in there. So again, uh, what that tells me as staff, as I've been immersed in this for a while, is that again, you know, these product types are very different. And you got to have, uh, deal with them with some sensitivity and understanding of the complexity here. So here's sort of a graphic image of that. Uh, again, these are the focusing on the areas of um, mixed use. Uh, excuse me. Well, yeah, mixed use in the red, the commercials uh, downtown, uh, Milpas, De La Vina, and La Cumbra. And then for the multifamily, here is where uh, it's being proposed to be also at the same density as the commercial, this 27 to 45. This is the Planning Commission's proposal. And then outside of that, and again, that helps to reinforce those traditional uh, transitions in land use. So when you get on the other side of the freeway where you don't have as much connectivity, sorry for the planning jargon there, Mr. Burke, um, but um, you, you, it's not as easy to walk, you know, between um, on the other side of the freeway to get to your commercial areas downtown. Here you see this is kept at our, our existing uh, densities. So, so that that's the planning commission option essentially. So then, uh, what uh, Council White has suggested is go ahead and take that out of there and reduce those densities here for the multifamily. So again, this is uh, planning commission, and this is you can you can sort of see the difference there, right? And then. Um, uh, so and then another option, and uh, ho hopefully I'm not overwhelming you with options here, but um, another option is this would be, this is the proposed rental uh, density overlay. So as you can see, it uh, captures um, uh, Milpas uh, and the downtown essentially. And again, th this is the area and, and part of the CM. Remember, remember, there's no residentials allowed in this part of the industrial, but the zoning today allows for uh, residential here. So. Um, this would, uh, you know, connect this up, and then eventually we would have better transit running, you know, all through in here. So, in any case, uh, this is what's being proposed now for this density increase of 50 percent to encourage, uh, you know, as a, as a added incentive to get these uh, rental projects built. So, one of the uh, options, uh, and this is sort of a corollary, if you will, to Council White's suggestion, is to shrink that up. So you go from this to this. And effectively, you get uh, a similar uh, outcome where this remains at a base density of up to 45 dwelling units per acre, and you don't get the higher uh, densities you have here. And I'll get into that, and tra I'll translate those for you in just a second here. I have, I think, some good examples. Anyway, so just kind of keep those in mind. So um, the key questions for you then are, um, 
what what should be the base densities in these uh, and, and rental overlays for the commercial multifamily districts? What type of units do you want to encourage? You know, is should the priority be rental employer workforce, or do we want to also be pushing the the for sale condos? You know what I mean? So that uh, th that's an important distinction I think here that needs to be made. And then where? You know, do you want downtown commercial, outlying commercial, multifamily adjacent to the downtown? Um, or one of those other options that, that Council White or the cor corollary is being presented here as kind of variations on the theme. So what will it look like? Um, we were asked to, to provide some real world examples of the the beast, and I've forgotten the, what the adjective was, the wildebeest, yeah. And um, but you know, I think it's a totally legitimate question is, is you know what 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 are we going to get here? So again, I I think it's instructive to look at sort of the spectrum of housing. And I don't I haven't included examples of the whole spectrum, but I I think uh, these are pretty well representative. So we start out. I'll start out with um, the big A affordables, and and some of these you've seen pictures of. But I think again, it's 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 helpful to look at them together. And they range anywhere from 56 to 124 dwelling units per, per acre. And, of course, that also includes single rent occupancy um, projects, which, you know, are really transitional housing when you're going from homeless. So it, it's a very different product type. Um, and those range, they're pretty small units. They range from 265 to 550 square feet. Uh, and they have less than one parking space per unit. Uh, generally, they're all two stories, and they have a FAR ranging somewhere between 0.89 and, and 1.5. The West Beach, the West Beach apartments, which um, uh, we've seen on a couple of occasions, pictures of them, and, and um, uh, those are, I think are fairly well accepted as being good examples of higher density housing in the Santa Barbara style with lots of open space and landscaping. Those range generally from 37 to 47 dwelling units per acre with either none to one space, parking space. And uh, those are generally two-story structures, and they range in FAR between 4.8 and 8.5. Now, Paseo Chapala, the, one of the mixed-use projects everybody loves to hate, um, is it comes in at about 29 uh, dwelling units per acre. Most of these, and it's on a three-quarter three acre site, most of these projects, I mean, excuse me, most of these units are on an average of about 1,400 square feet. And again, sort of give you a sense of that, marine terrace houses, you know, built in the 50s, about 900 square feet for three-bedroom houses. You know, different, different, different deal here. Um, with one plus spa parking spaces in this particular configuration, they have actual enclosed garages downstairs. Four, it has two four-story elements. One on the tower there above uh, Silver Greens, which is you know a, an aesthetic thing on a corner more important building. But also they have another, and I'll show you an example here of a little office uh, building. Uh, office unit set back. You don't really see it from the street. Their FAR is over 2.4. Now what's interesting here is um, when you look at this project, and I'll sh I, this is a very interesting example, and you sort of overlay, well, what would it look like if you apply the average unit density that's being proposed and, and the rental overlay? So in other words, you take this project and converted it to rental units these small rental units, what would you get and what would it look like? Well, you'd get 60 dwelling units per acre, almost double the amount of units, again, at this, the lowest size of the, the unit, a, an average of 600 square feet. And, and this was calculated at one space per unit, and it would drop it one story to three stories, and you'd have a pretty similar FAR, slightly lower. So let me uh, let the show begin here. So here's your... Um, Big A Affordable, El Carrillo, most of you are familiar with this, uh, 124 dwelling units per acre. And, you know, of course, this is, doesn't translate exactly because these are single room occupancy, which is a different product type. So, you know, if you were to put in, say, 600, um, uh, you know, an average of 600 dwelling units per acre, and I haven't done the math on this. 600 square foot? Uh, yes, thank you. 600, 600 square foot dwelling units. units per acre. 600 know, square I'm going foot. too okay. fast. Big okay, difference. I'm going to take a break. And it's three stories, I think, just to 
in your slide, you mentioned these were mostly two stories, but both Casa de las Fuentes and El Carrillo have a third story element, but it's in the back and you can, you can hardly see it. So Thank you, to, Madam Mayor. Yeah. I stand corrected. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, okay. So these are the big air affordables, mostly two two stories with some three-story elements. And um, again, if you you can do the math and take the SROs and uh, if this was reconfigured for an average size of 600 square foot units, you'd get considerably less. And I think, I don't have my calculator, I didn't have time to do that, but uh, you get a pretty high uh, 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 density there per unit. 27 parking spaces and FAR of a little bit over one. Casa Las Fuentes, similarly, uh, 40, now here you get 42 apartments, 42, one space per unit, 54 dwelling units per acre at about a uh, FAR of 1.0. And again, these are all subsidized projects, right? There's no market in here. West Beach Apartments. Uh, this is 109 West Mason. There are 12 apartments, and I, I should preface my remarks by saying we put this together very quickly, and we didn't really uh, have... Uh, sufficient time to do all the research to get, so I couldn't calculate, we couldn't calculate um, exactly uh, uh, the size of the units. We know they're pretty small units, um, so I can't really give you a lot of the same specifics I can on the more recent ones, but it gives you an understanding. The whole point of doing this is to give you a visual and understanding of the dwelling units per acre, basically, and the amount of parking where we could find it. So 12 units, nine parking spaces, so it's less than one per unit. And density of about 45 dwelling units per acre and FAR of about 0.85. Um, Los Patios apartment, uh, 12, 19 apartments, 18, pretty close to one to one here. Uh, density of 45 dwelling units per acre, uh, 0.48 FAR. And then here is... Uh, uh, 111 Chapala, one of my favorite projects. This photo doesn't really do it justice. 16 apartments, 17 spaces, 37 dwelling units per acre, and we weren't able to calculate the FAR on that one. Anna Pamu, 12 apartments, 316 West Anna Pamu, 12 apartments, 11 covered spaces, just under, you know, uh, one space per unit, 46 dwelling units per acre, and 0.68 FAR. So, Finally, uh, the Paseo Chapala, and again here, this is what's existing. You got 29 um, mostly market units. There's a few. Um, there's a few affordables in there, and I'm forgetting exactly how many. Eight affordable units in there, it's, but it's 29 percent. Yeah, so it's quite a, it's quite a few affordables in here, and you average. Uh, between the affordables and the markets, you average about 1,400 square foot per unit. Now this is this is a, a section cutaway here, and this is Chapala Street looking west. So if you're looking at the uh, the project west, you can see, you know, mostly it's a three-story project here, but it reads from the street. It's pretty close to the street here, and this is that four-story tower element, a decorative element, and then here's that little office here, the other four-story. So now, what you do is when you uh, when you apply. The average unit density of the base density of 45 dwelling units per acre at 600 square feet, and then you add 50 percent for uh, rental, uh, you get a total on this site of three-quarter acre site, 60 dwelling units at 600 square feet. So, so then what would that look like? So what you'd have here is it, you would re eliminate both four-story elements, you'd drop it down to three-story, and um, basically, these are the changes you'd see, but the rest of it would remain as, uh, essentially the same. Parking, the podium parking on the first floor, the commercial in the front. And uh, But what what's really significant, in addition to doubling the amount of units, you'd get an eight-foot setback here, and you'd get a wedding cake setback, you know, on the second story. And then uh, we're showing here a roof garden uh, as well. So it's a... Pretty significant change for this project. So, um, just sort of a wrap up on, in terms of our tools that we have uh, to help uh, uh, ensure that what we get the wildebeest that we want. Um, 
We have, you know, a pretty rigorous design review process that includes the ABR, the uh, HLC, and the Planning Commission as well for condominiums and, and tentative maps. We have uh, the design guidelines, over 26 design guidelines, and we're working on two more of them. And then, of course, the CEQA process. Every single project has to go through the CEQA process that looks at, you know, all these issues, the whole spectrum of issues. What Plan Santa Barbara is proposing are uh, additional tools, uh, re historic resource buffers and districts. Uh, there's now um, been proposed interim uh, guidelines for that and uh, to establish buffers around individual resources in the downtown as well as districts. Uh, looking at form-based code, that's, I think it's LG 13, LG 14 looks at form-based codes and uh, FARs, as um, as I said, these are very promising tools, and we think that these are going to help the community be even more surgical in the way that that uh, we um, uh, encourage in a proscriptive way the kind of projects that we want to see. Um, but you need to keep in mind that, uh, particularly for FARs. It's not a simple solution. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. And we, I have to be really open and frank with you here. We've struggled a lot in trying to come up with an, F, an FAR, an interim FAR that we could just kind of apply right now. And it, frankly, it, it's, um, it's a tall order. <laughs> and, and, and you look at the different uh, product types, for sale, mixed use in uh, all residential, market rental, employer housing, affordable housing, they all all have different needs in terms of, you know, their structural variable. What I call the structural variables: the densities, the unit sizes, the mix of uses, the appropriate parking, and then you know these exactions, the inclusionary or you know the the incentives like uh, rental overlay. All those things have to be kind of calculated and fitted in. And then on top of that, you got to look at where is it going to be. You know, is it you know in terms of location? Is it in the downtown? Not only is it in the downtown, is it near a historic uh, structure? Is it near a creek? Is it a block of view? Um, or is it a transition area next to a neighborhood? Um, and, and so. Uh, you, you want to be able to take advantage and um, get the incentives to build the product that we want, and um, uh, but you don't want to, uh, to constrain it too much. And, and it, so all I'm saying here is that um, it, it, it does not lend itself to a simple one-size-fits-all kind of a solution. So, um, so then the key questions, just like with the density in terms of the design, is is the existing design review process and proposed tools sufficient to ensure the types of buildings you want to see? And if not, exactly what is uh, needed? And, and that's the kind of detail that we need as staff in order to come back to you and come back to the Planning Commission in September and to you in, in November with, with what you want to see so we can meet your needs. So that's, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. I'm going to open up for questions, and I know we have public comments, so before I think we get into major decision mode, we want to hear from the public, but certainly questions and clarifications are helpful. Mr. White and then Ms. Self. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, John, on the Paseo Chapala project, um, I wasn't clear whether the, uh, the parking which is above ground on that project, whether the parking was included in the floor area calculations. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, Council White, absolutely that wasn't counted. Okay. They had, uh, the existing project has 39 parking spaces, and, you know, that's, you know, 29 or so for the, um, the units, but it also has for the commercial. They have to provide for that. And what we were calculating in this example that you saw was actually upping that to 60, so you'd have one per unit. So even with 60 parking spaces um, on a podium, you could you still achieve those kind of changes to the form mass okay. by reducing the units. Thank, thank you. And then in the, the, in the work that you folks have been doing these years, is the, um, are, you, are you looking at the commercial core having residential only? Potential at the, at the com without the, uh, w with the with the commercial setbacks. You know that that's kind of one of the historic issues is uh, mixed use has gone forward in order to take advantage of the uh, 
looser or the, the more permissive setbacks. And I didn't know whether in the work that you folks have been doing, do you, do you, is it assumed that, that full-on residential could happen in the commercial core with the commercial uh, setbacks? Madam Mayor and Council Member White, the um, city has mostly seen the mixed-use projects in the commercial zones, but we, um, the current zoning, the current review process, as well as Plan Santa Barbara, um, does allow and anticipate 100% um, residential units. Today, if, uh, or projects, today if you propose that, as Council Member White is saying, you don't get the benefit of reduced setbacks with the commercial zone. So if you build a housing project on C2 land and it's entirely residential, the R3 setbacks apply. Um, we have talked about, um, and it's on our list of things to do, not only just with Plan Santa Barbara, but when the opportunity is there, to look at establishing a setback for um, commercial zones. And so a question would be is once we establish that setback, if we feel that it's adequate for the street um, design and, and street um, character, then could that same standard be applied instead of the R3? That's, a, that's an open question um, that would be good to have more direction on. We have not been that specific in terms of a policy in that regard. Um, I have personally, I've had a concern that the mixed use projects, although they are not required by code to have a setback, that the planning commission and the design review boards do have the ability to look at the findings that you have to make, particularly in a condominium, that setbacks can be required in those projects. And, and often they are actually. We don't see a zero lot line condition in the mixed use projects. Maybe along one property line, but not the entirety of the project. So um, I think we would want to move in the direction of having a new setback that works for all residential in the commercial zones that's not exactly what we have today. So I think it requires some adjustment. Okay, thank you. And this is our opportunity to ask questions, right, yep. Madam Mayor? Yep. Okay. Um, I think those are my questions for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Self. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> am I correct in understanding you had mentioned that all projects go through the CEQA process? But part of the CEQA process is that if it is affordable, it is exempted from CEQA review. Am I correct there? Madam Mayor and Council Member Self, there are specific CEQA exemptions for affordable housing projects, and some of the projects we've seen meet the exemptions, but others have required uh, additional environmental review. So not all affordable projects are statutorily exempt. We still do need to do environmental review on um, a number of uh, affordable projects. So, um, for example, um, there are other exemptions that do get used. There are statutory exemptions that specifically apply to affordable project if you meet all that criteria. And then there are categorical exemptions that can apply. I'm trying to think um, for quite some time, I think there have been a few projects where we did a negative declaration for an affordable housing project, but predominantly they are found exempt, yes. Thank you. And my other question is, uh, would you please explain form-based zoning? <laughs> oh, in a nutshell, okay. Yes, form-based coding. Um, I've been to a few uh, seminars on form-based coding, and I just want to comment that I also attended uh, the Ventura. We held workshops in Ventura, and two planning commissioners attended this particular one along with me. That was Charmaine Jacobs and Bruce Bartlett. And I believe Commissioner Bartlett has gone on to even do more study of form-based codes. So in Santa Barbara, uh, we have, I think, a knowledge base of what form-based codes um, is within uh, professional planners in the community and in our department, as well as architects in the community and people on our, our boards. But we haven't actually rolled up our sleeves and done any form-based coding work in our community. Um, the community of Ventura has, has done quite a bit. So what it is, is looking at the streetscape and the pattern of development. 
um, form-based coding, like a lot of architectural design concepts, um, really wants to look at the full street area, building face to building face. So when we look at our design guidelines right now, they're usually looking at one building. Well, form-based codes will look at a sectional of building face to building face and the form of that whole area, the streetscape environment. Another thing about form-based coding is um, along the lines of what Mr. Ledbetter presented in our presentation today, is a section, I think they call it a transect, of your entire community running from the downtown most intense core going a transect through the community out to open space on the edges, lower density, medium density, multiple family density, and then into the core of the commercial. So that's another concept that's important to keep in mind, basic things in form-based coding, the transect of the community as a whole, and then the streetscape building face to building face. Our urban design guideline document, which I hope you've all um, had an opportunity to review is the closest thing we have to the form-based coding in terms of the the street face area, building face to building face, and including the street. We also did talk about this concept a little bit in the Upper State Street area, where again many of the diagrams and the study and the guidelines take the entirety of the State Street area. In order to develop um, workable form-based coding, uh, the recommended approach and most successful approach is a community engagement process, um, typically something what they would call a charrette, where you go out and you study a specific area of the community. People walk the area like we did in the Upper State Street area. We have a lot of photographs and drawings of the buildings that we have in the area. Um, I really do think that the Upper State Street study is is a close first step to what would be done for form-based coding, and that's why we recommended in the Upper State Street study, mm -hmm. and part of the Council's action is to consider form-based codes for the Upper State Street area. So you look, as we did there, are there differences on the north side of the street or the south side of the street? And indeed, there really are, particularly with regard to views opportunities. Um, you look at corner. You look from one corner to the other. You may treat buildings in the middle differently than you treat in the corner. And so basically, you end up with a, a written code as well as diagrams. So that's another difference of form-based coding. And if you read our current zoning ordinance, it's just a written document. If you look at our design guidelines, they're visual. And so what form-based coding does is it kind of combines the written code and the visual type of guideline into one document. And I think I'll just stop there. There really is quite a bit more to it, but, I, but those are the yeah. key elements. And also, uh, Chair Bartlett is here, and I know he's very much aware and active in Ventura about form-based just coding, but maybe when you speak later, you can add to that. Okay. Madam Mayor, and just a couple of other comments on that. Um, a couple of the tenets of that are, are based in um, adding more certainty to the process, uh, both from a developer's perspective as well as the community's perspective, because in, you're creating something more prescriptive that you want to see in terms of uh, the size of it, the bulk of it, where you want, how the windows line up. Doesn't you're not dictating the exact architecture, but you are dictating how these buildings relate to one another, uh, uh, side by side. How they relate, as Miss We said, to the street. How they relate to the, the buildings across the street. You know, to views, anything like that. The other really important thing on a pure form-based coding concept is that once you've established the box, if you will, then you don't really regulate what goes on inside. I mean, within parameters. And in other words, um, you could have it as dense as you, as many as the building code, as many re residential units as the building code would allow, uh, or you could switch it all to commercial, or you could, you know, within reason. You know, we, obviously you can't do, you can't exceed the building code or um, uh, health and safety kind of issues. Um, but that's on a pure sort of form-based coding. Now, what's uh, the trend in the, in the profession has been? It's kind of getting away from pure form-based coding, and, and you're beginning to see more melding and uh, com combining things with a little bit more detailing in terms of the zoning, the types of uses, or the, maybe the size of units in our case, uh, that kind of thing. But it is, it's, it's, it's an intriguing, interesting um, uh, 
process and, and and it does take but it does take time because you are being very specific it's a block by block assessment and again it adds to this what I like to call the sort of a surgical approach to to development you're really laying out what you want to see on a block by block to ensure that you get the things that you want the open spaces the view preservation the heights um, and, and what, what have you so in my nutshell, it sounds like properties in very close proximity would have different limitation based on the overall desired effect. So one property, because of this form-based zoning, would be limited as to its potential versus another property. Is uh, that? Well, I wouldn't... <laughs> That's probably taking it a little too far. I, I, I would say more. It's like block by block is more typical because you, you know, the idea is you want everything to kind of work together, and so you visually want it to work together, and it's, you know, it's a block by block. But you know, f in a case of view preservation, perhaps that might be the case. I, d I don't know. Uh, but mostly, it, it, you look at bigger chunks. You don't look at just. Um, it's, you wouldn't have a whole set of regulations just for one parcel. That, that typically is not how it's done. Neighbor have to have all the open space for the big yeah. chunky it, thing next door. Yeah, typically wouldn't do that, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mr. Williams? Well, I, I had a question about these alternatives, and, and sort of the source of my question is uh, that as far as I can tell from these more desirable looking high density projects they are they tend to be ones that uh, as uh, Commissioner Lodge was indicating the other day that are all residential even if they're in commercial areas um, some of them obviously are not I, I live in a in, in a, a pro project that's very much like that um, uh, I counted the number of units this morning and there's over a hundred on one block. Um, this is the Via Constance. There's the north and the south. So if you ever look it up, you have to look up both. And it's on the same block as the Red Cross complex. So even with the Red Cross complex, there's uh, about 100 units there. If the Red Cross complex was similar density of, of housing project, probably be another 30 or so units. So there's easily 30 units per acre-ish uh, on that site. And you go there, there's adequate setbacks, it's two stories, it's nice. Now, one of the reasons why it's that way is there's, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, it would not conform to current parking requirements. Um, but we have a pretty easy time uh, living there, and so do a lot of other people. The other reason is because, you know, my unit's well under 900 square feet. Um, uh, even some of the two bedrooms, I think, are approximately... Uh, that size. Um, uh, mine's one of the one bedroom. Um, but I guess if that's the kind of housing that I think is desirable, that most people in Santa Barbara go, okay, well, that's not what I thought high density was. Um, but I mean, it corresponds to uh, I, what I look at the density recommended by the hybrid package. And yet the alternatives suggested seem to indicate that's not what we want, that we want to only just do this stuff in the commercial zone. And I, so is there any alternative, I mean, is that, is that, am I understanding that right? Um, Council Member Williams, uh, there, there is a concern on the part of staff, and I think you'll hear from members of the community that have um, mentioned this to us, that in taking out the residential R3, the adjacent R3 downtown, there's a concern because the cost of land is greater in the commercial area than in the adjoining um, R3. And particularly if this program is to be of use in terms of rental housing, that we think it is important to continue to look at the ad adjoining R3 lands as an appropriate um, area to be included in these programs. Um, so, does that answer your question? So, essentially, no, that the alternatives take that out, the multifamily. Well, we, we missed, uh, Council Member White asked to see a map of what this would look like, and so that's why we provided these particular attachments to your report, option one and two. Um, but I can tell you that 
the, count, the Planning Commission spent some time on this as well, what areas to include or not include. Um, at earlier maps, um, there were other R3 areas shown towards the east, and there was a decision perhaps to exclude those. In particular, a good part of it was the bungalow district area, and that didn't particularly make sense. Or to the east of Milpa Street, could that be included or not be included? Those discussions have been ongoing. Where we got to as staff um, um, is the area that we thought was most important to include is the west downtown R3 adjacent area, although I do want you to know that all, a number of other R3 areas were explored as well. So essentially the, the, the Planning Commission hybrid allows an opportunity for doing that kind of development in the, in the west downtown and, and the, the option does not, the option two does not. Okay. Thank you. Mr. House. Um, well, I, I, by the way, I appreciate the question about form-based um, codes, and the, that opens up a whole lot. I mean, and I, 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 I think maybe one of the things that will come out of our update may be that we, um, while we won't all get it a, like a study right now, we'll be planning on learning more and more about that and how we might, you know, integrate or make make bring that into our we do a lot of it with our pyramid zoning anyway right here it just turns out that santa Barbara's been doing that with our grid lots of stuff has really lent us to go in that direction with all the guidelines we've been doing that because one of the things um just i gotta say this is almost uh, wonderful about it is you would stand literally in a neighborhood look around and see what's what's going on there and 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 get to know the neighborhood really well and begin to identify what what its past is, what its current situation is, and begin to ask questions about what the likely and appropriate future would be for that area, not just on a parcel by parcel basis, but as you said, uh, you know, um, the, the whole block, for instance. And it's it's so much more refined and nuanced, but it does take into consideration some of these concerns we keep he hearing, if, if I understand it correctly, um, where neighborhoods feel very threatened by current zoning that's done in these big swaths, you know, and they get caught up in it somehow. But really, they've got this character already, and they're threatened. So I want to know more about that as well and how this can be um, useful in one way or another to, uh, to, our, um, to, our, to our town. The, um, okay, so question about FARs, and I want to be sure I get this. In any, pretty much any mixed-use development in downtown um, that we've been talking about or seeing coming along is built on a podium Either or has submerged parking, that's more expensive, but usually build on a podium. And it makes pretty much no sense to have setbacks for the podium. I mean, if you look at it in a commercial where you've got lot line to lot line zoning that's um, for commercial, um, then whatever might come next, next door, will probably be right up to the lot line if it's a wholly commercial. And if it has any commercial component at all, it's going to use that space. So I'm wondering about FARs that are on top of the podium. I mean, like, that's, for the people that live there, isn't that, that's their basis of, they don't even notice, you don't even notice that there's a, a, a garage underneath. It's like a plaza on top. So in that, if you go back to that picture for a second of the, um, what is it, Paseo Chapala in cross section? Yeah, one of those there. So as far as the people that are living in the place are concerned, they have an interior courtyard, they've got a, Let's go back to the other one just for a second, that, that one you just had there. So if we look at it, that bottom stuff doesn't even exist for them. Um, and on the front, you've got commercial on the ground floor, so that's what's pre present to the street. And, of course, the big issue seems to be the, the, um, the way that whole front facade communicates with the rest of the community and how it, you know, it, uh, how it helps to frame what the streetscape is. But for the interior, the life of the, of the project is on the interior. It's facing inward, typically, and more likely, because there might be a big building built right next door. So when we do our FAR calculations, I'm more interested in what the FAR is on top of a podium, because you're going to have a podium or commercial or something on that ground floor anyway in, the, in a downtown commercial C2 zoned environment. It would be pretty unlikely that somebody would come along if it were 100% commercial and develop with 
10 foot setbacks on the side of the building and I mean it just wouldn't make any sense these would be dead dangerous places for people so I just want to um, and I do know that setbacks on the sides for air and light and all that stuff so when we talk about this my question really goes to do we have calculations for what that FAR is on top of the podium for the actual living environment that's up there uh, for this particular project or do you think just in general well, I mean, I, averages? obviously has it been worked out for this one I believe so, yes. Um, Mr. Campanella is raising his hand. He might know the oh, answer. Good. Okay. Oh, maybe you can come up, come Mr. Up Campanella. Come up to the podium. Just, but quick, you know, just I, for... This is helpful for me to begin to frame a way of looking at this concept of... Anyone the knows it's you. ...living environment downtown that makes more sense to me because the podium to me seems like the given, the given for the mix of commercial and residential. Uh, yes, uh, Com Commissioner House. Uh, sorry, Council Member House. Uh, okay, the, took it uh, as a compliment. Areas, uh, it's a point five, about point five two. The livable area on level two and level three, where the units are, either townhouses or flats, two-story townhouses or flats, uh, is about point five two of the total land area. So uh -huh. the rest of the space is comprised of the open space or the village concept or the old Santa Barbara look, if you would like, uh, as well as uh, walkways. Uh, patios and decks, elevators and things like that. But the inside of the unit, which I think is a good way to measure it, because that's where you're putting people. You know, how many, uh, how livable is the spot between one bedrooms and two bedrooms uh, on the top of the deck? And uh, it's about 0.52 each level. So of the 2.04 that you saw, about one of that is the podium and about 0.2 is each level, 0.52 right. is each level. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That helps a lot. And, and I mean, because when I look at that, it looks a little bit like uh, El Paseo above the podium. You know, it looks kind of like that environment. And some of these, like I think uh, Casa de los Fuentes is a good example, too. You get up in there, uh, up on that upper part above the uh, garage, and it's just sort of like that. A uh, question on um, no f money for affordable housing after redevelopment agency expires. Is that true? Or is there, uh, I mean, how, how are we going to come up with money for affordable housing after RDA goes away? Council uh, Member House, uh, the city team, including um, Brian Bossi, did a study to look at what the future questions would be in terms of the purposes and the benefits the community has had with the RDA. And one is clearly the um, contribution to affordable housing in the community. And I think that um, to say that there would be no money for affordable housing isn't exactly accurate. There won't be funds coming from that particular source. But again, I think that the, um, the council has had discussions about um, what to do with the tax in revenue that will come to the city. There will still be tax revenue coming to the city. It's a smaller, much smaller portion of the pie because the redevelopment had all the tax increment. That'll go back to other agencies as well as the city's um, portion. So um, uh, the question to the council will be how should that how should those monies be spent how are general fund monies also spent and um, my understanding is that there's an interest on the part of the council to continue to to have partnerships and um, funding available for some level of affordable housing um, also there are federal funds um, and grants and other programs that I believe the city would continue to participate in but um, it, this will, and I can't tell you the percentage, but it's a substantial change, a substantial reduction in the funding available for affordable housing from what we have experienced in all these years with our RDA. But um, that'll be a policy and financial decision of the council um, moving forward of how to, f how to participate and fund um, affordable housing in the community. So be, we would essentially take the general fund, which would be increased by the, the tax increase over time of the redevelopment, in the redevelopment agency, and it would be a discretionary call on how much of that to divide, to cut off for specifically and direct uh, affordable That's housing. That's an option for the council to consider. I see. I, I believe that that could likely be the future, but it's not my call. Got it. Um, Haley Gutierrez and Coda, you've got a, on the map, could you pop that up there, John? Um, um, I see there's a gray toned area there. There. Now that in that in that image there, it looks like there's a there's sort of a preview that that's a likely place. I mean, to me, it seems just a 
put a chip, chip in here for it, that that's a likely place for some kind of um, residential, commercial, along the transit corridors. Is that what I'm seeing on this map? Is that thrown a Yes, that, that's correct. Um, the, you know, the land values, and again, uh, we try to be cognizant of where the opportunity sites are to build affordable housing, and this is one area where the land values aren't as high as in, you know, either the commercial downtown zoning or the, the west downtown areas, and yet um, it's along, there are long transit corridors, and the, the zoning there now allows it. It doesn't allow it at the same densities. You know, these currently now, um, what, what's being proposed is not the highest density, it's the lower one, but with the, um, the rental overlay, that would bump it up to around 45 dwelling units per acre. Now, we could certainly make adjustments to that if that's the council's desire, so. Because yeah, it would seem like that would sort of underdeveloped, underutilized at this point with uh, not a significant adjacent um, uses that might have. Yeah, the only caveat there, and, and this is really why we differentiated between the two industrial areas, is it's, it's all about gentrification. And, and once you let housing into the area, it gentrifies and, and all the land values go up. And you certainly don't want that in your, in what little, you know, we have 1% of industrial area, and that's where you do all your auto repair and, you know, any kind of manufacturing goes on in those areas. And there, it's a hold somewhat similar for the CM as well is that, you know, right now we have limited commercial in there, but once you see, once housing starts going in there, it'll gentrify the area pretty quickly and the land values will go up. So you just, so and, and what that does... Off of, off of those streets themselves. And it, off, yeah, it, depla careful. it displaces these other uses mm -hmm. and, you know, where do they go? So right. that, that's just, you know, it's part of that balancing act that we, we need to be careful of and, and that's part of the reasons that we weren't proposing as high densities in there just for that reason but well, that's something I want to look at when we get yeah. get to it um, and then the last thing goes a little bit on the line that um, I was hearing mr. Williams talk about I'm looking around town and I see um, apartments and condominiums in densities that I mean I'm, I'm presuming they are I mean I'm looking up at the um, affordable housing there between highway 154 and um, La Cumbra, there's, I mean, we have that, that whole bunch of units back in there just off behind Cai Real. You've got, um, uh, not to mention uh, St. Vincent's, but then um, uh, the Kyleralis area and State and all back in there. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of apartment houses in there and condos. I mean, j and not just on State Street, that's deep. Or even on uh, Annapamu, near Milpa Street, you know, the big apartment houses that go up there and condos that go up the, up the hill. And so um, where do they figure into this? Because, uh, first of all, at some point, one would expect them to need to be um, maintained, upgraded, or improved. And, um, and yet, um, and oh, and, and, and we also see apartment houses built maybe three or four decades ago in R2 and R3 all over town that aren't really, you know, clustered right against the State Street. But since the town's so small and the grid works pretty well, they're, they, they kind of work. So are we acing out that for the future in this plan? Yeah. Um, Madam Mayor, Councilman Williams, House, um, actually that, that raises a couple of really interesting uh, points, um, one of which is sort of historical, and if you go back and you look at our original zoning that dates back to the 20s, originally you know, we allowed uh, one unit per thousand square feet, and when you translate that out per acre, you know, 43, 560 is, you know, uh, what an acre is, thousands of feet, you know, you're getting pretty close to 45 dwelling units per acre, 43 dwelling units per per acre. So, you know, that is, again, a lot of these projects that you see in West Beach, they're around that, that that's about the density that they're at. Now, fast forward to the to the 60s and 70s, and, you know, you get a lot of these apartments that were built uh, rather quickly uh, and not perhaps with a, as much aesthetic des um, design as we would have liked to have seen, but they do fill a real need for, for affordable housing. And then fast forward another 10 years and the concern with um, Santa Barbara growing, you know, and at that point we were pretty, um, I don't want to say naive, but we, uh, we were just beginning this whole uh, a process of growth management and seeing what works, what doesn't. You know, we down, there was a pretty massive downzoning in the 70s, and that's where we got, 
you know, uh, uh, got rid of a lot of these higher density, a lot of these higher densities. So, uh, so now what we're left with are sort of these vestiges of prior um, zonings, and the question is, you know, well, which ones work? Which ones don't work? And you know, which ones do we want to encourage? And and you know, you need to look. Uh, look at that carefully and where do you want to encourage that kind of a density what do you want it to look like and who should it be for who should be living there I mean at the risk of sounding too much like a social engineer you know you, that does need to kind of be considered you know you, if because if you're just increasing the densities flat out across the board with no consideration of that you know you're going to get a lot of uh, for sale high density stuff and is that exactly what you want or for sale high income i mean in the sense of not addressing workforce needs exactly and and the the fact of the matter is um, you know we if you do let's say over the next 20 years we do get two or three two or three of these higher density rental projects for the workforce, most likely they're going to be uh, a little bit higher on the higher end, sort of like you see out in Goleta and Willow Springs and that kind of a thing. That's the kind of product that we're basically um, anticipating we'll see, but a little bit denser and units slightly smaller than what you're seeing out there. And even if we were only to achieve two or three of those over the next 20 years, um, it adds to the housing stock of affordable workforce. So maybe your doctors are going to live there, your nurses, and sort of the higher end of the workforce, but it also relieves a lot of the pressure and, and some of the other housing stock that they're living in now is freed up and becomes more affordable. So that's kind of the concept here of creating um, market rental. Madam Mayor, if I might add one comment to respond to what happens to those older projects. Um, in the outlying R3 areas that wouldn't be included, say, in the, this rental zone or something, um, if the new um, base density is changed from the bedroom to the unit size and our medium high goes up to about 25 dwelling units per acre, a number of those apartment buildings will still be non-conforming. So there is a policy recommended in the housing element because we've heard this direction from the commission, the community, I believe members of the council as well, an opportunity um, to improve the and rebuild the rental housing. Uh, right now there's a greater incentive to demolish the rental housing and build condominiums, which some people have referred to as the two-step. So in order to preserve rental housing, we're recommending um, changes in the code to allow um, Improvement and including rebuilding rental housing at non-conforming densities. So that may many be the of those reassurance that I'm looking for. Yeah, we, many of those apartments that. will still remain non-conforming. This program is going to bring some projects closer to conformity, but what it's about is for new construction opportunities. This, this incentive. And again, the variable density based on unit size is an incentive. It's not, I, I think people don't understand this exactly. It's not an across the board that every one of the parcels that you see on this map would go to the 45 or certainly 45 plus 50 percent. Those are in specific rental projects that would go somewhere up to 45, probably not 45 if, if they're not all 600 averaged. But there would still be the base density on these um, properties and that base density is 12 dwelling units per acre. So I think I, I'm hoping that all of you have heard the discussion about a two-tier or the base density still applying and then what we've been presenting is an incentive program. And I think that people perhaps don't understand that and that they look at this map and believe that every parcel would be developed under that unit size um, incentive program. Well, thank you for those explanations. And I think the, the, the thrust of my question is I, I'm, I'm hoping that we don't get into um, disincentivizing or incentivizing gentrification and reduction of units of vitally important housing stock, especially rentals. And we've seen that kind of thing in these uh, remodels from time to time that have been really devastating to a community. And I'm, uh, I'm watching real closely to be sure that we don't do that. Mr. Francisco. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it seems to me that if you look at the general plan update proposal at its most basic, the, the central idea here seems to be that by increasing density 
downtown that we will achieve two things, more affordable housing, a higher percentage of affordable housing, presumably, and reduce traffic congestion. So my first question is, do you have examples of similarly situated cities that have applied those policies and gotten those results? I, I do believe that I can provide you that information, but not right now off the top of my head. Okay. Um, Planning Commissioner Lodge, uh, last meeting or meeting before, brought up the point that we have 12% affordable housing right now in the city of Santa Barbara. And that this was considerably higher, in some cases twice as much as nearby jurisdictions. So how does our percentage of affordable housing compare with similarly situated cities? Um, uh, Madam Mayor, Councilman uh, Francisco, well, first, just to clarify the 12% number, that number is actually a little close to 11, and that and also includes what we call the Section 8 housing. Those are of vouchers course. that the federal government provides, sure. and so they're not, quote, permanently affordable at any given time that Congress could decide to yank that program and then that all, the, all that affordability would go away. So when you take but that's true for any city. That's true for any city. So when you take that away, you know, I think I believe we're closer to something. I think that's three. So we're closer to about like nine percent is a permanently affordable housing. Okay. Um, and I think you know that is something that that. Um, the city has a uh, right to be very uh, proud of that's uh, uh, compared to other cities that is a high percentage of a uh, very low and um, uh, affordable uh, permanently affordable housing so um, I don't again I don't have the statistics to rattle off but th that's um, I would completely agree with with um, uh, with Ms. Lodge that 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 is uh, we, we've done an excellent job in providing very low permanently affordable housing. Okay. Well, I, I would appreciate some data on similarly situated cities and, and their percentage of affordable housing and permanently affordable or otherwise. Uh, a question concerning, uh, okay, another concept that seems to me to be central to the general plan update is changing uh, how we look at bonus density and focusing on unit size rather than number of bedrooms, uh, which in general I think is a sensible concept. How did we come up with the thousand square feet as the average? Uh, Madam Mayor, Councilman uh, Francisco, uh, from two different uh, directions. One of them, we um, uh, had an economic study done and they looked at what the, the market is basically for um, uh, two bedroom units what 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 the market is um, ownership or rental for ownership and then um, this was also played out uh, by our local uh, developers working with the local developers and architects this is about sort of what was referred to as the sweet spot for a two bedroom two bath type unit where you could um, rent out one of the bedrooms or you could use it as your office it just that's where the highest amount of market demand is so for um, when you look at the demographics that we are required to do through the housing element and look at what the trends are in the future, for four sales, the uh, family sizes are shrinking, and this, this is the type, the size of unit that is most desired, right? Now, you look at the demographics for rental, and it's, it's, it differs in that the size of the families are getting bigger, and you need larger rental units, larger than... Uh, a thousand square feet, so more bedrooms, if you will. So the idea is, well, you need a strategy for that, and you know, part of that is looking at not only rental housing because that the larger families tend to be um, renters in in our city, but also then how do you encourage these bigger 
uh, units with more uh, bedrooms. And so hence that's the policy of looking at uh, a community benefit project would be one that had rental but larger units for bigger families. And so they would get an incentive for increased density to build those types of units. So really there's sort of a dual uh, a dual prong strategy here for market and for rental trying to address the demographic trends that we've been seeing. So, so then what you're saying is that that thousand square foot average, you're really looking at ownership units only. So we would need a different average for rental. Well, no, that that's it includes both, and and that's where I was trying to go to with here, looking at when we looked at the alternatives. Right now, the way it's structured, if you look down at the bottom here, in the high, there's a range between 27 and 45. So the thousand square foot units, the two bedrooms, would be at the lower. Uh, density at the 27 and then as you got to the higher densities you get to the smaller units and so the idea is that you would meet that demand for uh, 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 smaller units and higher densities for market because there is some demand for that as well but it would be even it would be most effective in the rental where uh, you want, would want smaller units than uh, a thousand square feet so hence the um, uh, you know the the overlay, the fifty percent overlay. Well, I, I certainly that, th there are all kinds of different renters out there, and certainly there are renters who want six hundred square foot apartments. Um, but you're also talking about rental units for families with a significant number of of bedrooms. So that's not going to be a 600 square foot apartment. No, it is not, and, and that and that points to the complexity of the issue here, and and the and how difficult it is to have a one size fit all kind of a situation. So, you know, I, ideally you're going to have those bigger units that are that are geared towards the family, not necessarily in the downtown. Those might want you might want to encourage those in the outer lying areas. So that's why it's important to have, you know, a rental overlay that, that accommodates that uh, strategy as well. Okay. Um, another goal of this update as it stands today is, and this goes to the idea of this being able to reduce traffic and traffic congestion, uh, that by increasing the density downtown, more of the downtown workforce is going to live downtown and presumably walk to work and walk to services. So what do we know about the demographics of the downtown workforce today? How many workers, what income levels, what percentages? Madam Mayor, uh, Councilmember Francisco, well, we we don't have the we have all the demographic information from census data. What we found out in the model is that um, there are significant amounts of people who live downtown who also work either in downtown or in the city. the The strategy for uh, housing, uh, introducing housing in in Santa Barbara from a traffic congestion minimization of impact is if they're located in the downtown area, they generate far less traffic and are more likely to work within the city. If you, if you place, uh, conversely, if you place housing in other parts of the city, uh, they are more likely to have an impact to the intersections that are, are congested and the upper state street, the freeway intersections, interchanges, and then also the upper state street uh, uh, corridor. The, uh, so those are the two, so, so that relates to, that answer relates to placement. Where is the best place to place housing, no matter how much you, you put it, how much you put into the city. Uh, in terms of how much you put into the city, that, that plays into uh, job growth. So we're gonna have an incremental amount of commercial that's going to relate to a certain amount of jobs. What we found in the model uh, analysis is that if the, the fewer housing units we place in the city, then the more jobs have to be imported from out, um, 
employees from outside the city into the city to take the new jobs that were that were occurring. So, you know, so that's where you get the in the uh, in the plan Santa Barbara, which had two million square feet of new commercial, that had a lot more jobs and less housing. And you kind of get the flip when you go to the alternative uh, two, which was the increased housing. You had a lot more housing, and then half the commercial. Uh, aside from the TDM strategies, the travel demand management strategies, that, that had a lot to do with uh, where people were coming from. So I hope that that answers the question in terms of intent of of, of how houses play in. The, the 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 bottom line is that if you put a housing unit in the downtown. Uh, it, it what we found based on the model is it plays neither a it doesn't have a negative impact on your intersections and it and it may have a positive influence on congestion. That's interesting. I'd I'd like to talk with you sometime in more detail about how the model arrived at those conclusions. But the real question I'm asking is the idea here seems to be that if we concentrate more housing downtown, we're going to reduce commuting. Is that true? We, we, we will. It depends on how much commercial you're going to add, how many jobs you're going to add. But yes, we, we will. It, we need housing in general to match the new jobs we're creating. And you also, I would assume, need housing in general to match the jobs you have. That's correct. In fact, we found we had to apply a certain percentage of loss over time to the to the amount, or we had to import more employees over time, regardless of development, because uh, because of the factor that's true, and it has occurred in the last uh, decade, particularly, of people who are in jobs now who have been in 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 jobs for a long time in Santa Barbara. And then, because they've been in so long, they actually have ownership or live locally. And then, when they're replaced, when they retire, when they're replaced, of the a higher portion of people not being able to live uh, in Santa Barbara, therefore we have to import them from uh, Ventura. They've had to come from Ventura or from a, a northern, north of the city. Okay. So, what I'm getting at is, do we have data that says this is how many people are working downtown. This is their income level. Because, just to give you an example, to take it to an extreme, let's say that we knew that 50% of all of the jobs downtown are service jobs that pay $20,000 a year or less. And the goal was to house those people downtown. That would be one kind of picture. If we found that those numbers were radically different, it would be a radically different picture. So that's that's what I'm trying to get at. What kind of data do we have about the number of jobs downtown and the incomes associated with those jobs? Yeah, we can we can look at some of that information. It's it's been all over the map with the different studies that we've done over the past, I'd say, two decades. I think that one we found out when we talked to the we went to the downtown organization retreat. Uh, toward the um, in January one of the things we heard in the focus groups very clearly is you know why are you talking so much about um, for sale housing the employees that we have are all renting and um, that's what we heard very loud and clear and I think that that's when we started talking more about rental housing and the Planning Commission I think heard that too and they they threw on this big overlay uh, you know, kind of at a blink of a you know an eye, okay, fifty percent overlay, mm -hmm. um, to try to uh, to try to 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 get at that need. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, I think that's good. I think that's that's a good direction. That's responding to reality. But it it sounds like at least right now it's responding to an indistinct reality, and that, that we need some data. Um, the other the other benefit that this intensification of housing downtown uh, is supposed to create is we supposedly have people who are commuting long distance to jobs downtown. Well, not supposedly. We know that we do have people doing that. I don't know that we know how many they are. 
And so my question again is, have we done the research to know how many of those long distance commuters there are to downtown jobs? And secondly, do we know what kind of housing those kinds of commuters want or would tolerate? You know, I, I see Debbie Cox Bolton in the back from Coastal Housing Coalition, and uh, unless Mr. Dayton has some direct information, because the line of questioning I'm hearing, I think, goes directly to the work that you do every year. So I don't know if you, if you have that kind of information on you in, with your surveys and things. Okay. Okay. Well, Mr. Dayton, I'm sorry to well, interrupt, but here's that what I'll be say. helpful. I mean, we can find out all that information. What, what we have found out is you do not need all that information to know what the reality of the picture is. And what we found in the model with the trips and the, the generation from employees is that we are, we are losing, and I think that people all have agreed at this in the process, we are losing a battle with having employees in the city. In other words, just what we've talked about in the last statements is that the people who are taking the jobs of the future have a difficult time living in the city. And that puts a strain on the interchanges. So our future strategy is, needs to, uh, com if we don't want to live with the congestion that more and more employees from outside the community will incur, is that we will have to provide some amount of affordable housing, however we do that strategically, uh, or we will continue to lose ground in that area. Fair enough. But would you agree that you would have to know what these workers you're supposedly hanging on to can afford before you know if you're providing the right kind of affordable housing. I would I would say yes, and I think the product that we're that we're missing that we found out through our process in the last ten years is the one that's between uh, big A affordable and market, and it's and it's it's not what we've been providing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you answered some of the questions that I had in speaking with Mr. Francisco, and I'm going to repeat one, though, that maybe comes to your circulation answer. If we're trying to get affordable housing, but particularly we're trying to encourage private sector affordable, affordable housing or moderately priced housing, why are we putting it on the most, ex or why are we zoning it on the most expensive land in town? Because land cost completely governs um, cost of housing and therefore the likelihood that uh, developer would do it. And that, by that I mean the downtown, I think you've said that that's the most expensive area. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Hotchkiss, I think the, Ms. Weiss and I will try to team on this. I, I could tell you that I think that that's the, the kind of the major difference between the, what the Planning Commission was proposing and, and what Council Member White was proposing is that the R3 area that's right adjacent to downtown probably does provide that lesser expensive land uh, to, to accomplish or avoid what you're saying, putting the lowest cost housing on the highest cost land. Another part of the answer is um, what we've seen in the last decade or more is that the um, ability to improve commercial property um, with residential, I mean non-residential development is, is very restricted in the city with the adoption of the growth management plan and measure E. So people who own commercial property in order to attain the value of their property um, have pursued mixed use and housing. So um, on, res on commercial property though, there still is the ability to do a certain amount of commercial development and that does factor into the equation. We did ask um, our economist in the, the study that we did um, how does the how does the economy work in terms of the commercial? So what we found is that the commercial pretty much covers its own cost. That if all you could do was the commercial development, um, you could still do a project, but it was really the housing that brought you the benefit of the project. So yes, it's higher land value, but that's why people have been doing um, mixed use in the commercial area. And so that does allow for some affordable housing to be built. What we also found is the development community when we adopted the 15% inclusionary under all the rules that we have now that allow people to do two car garages and 
no limit on unit size and all those other things, that the inclusionary requirement could also be factored in as a net zero in the overall construction we did performance of mixed use projects with underground parking, above ground parking, market rate housing and inclusionary and those did work. The entire performa worked and that's why we have seen a few mixed use um, housing projects that included affordable housing. So I think the proof is on the ground um, that it did work in the downtown area. Okay, I'm not entirely sure I understood all of that, but there was a lot of information there, but we can come back to that. Um, our, our population has actually dropped, as far as we can tell, over the last few years. So who describe to me the person that's going to either rent or buy, as far as you can see. Just you know, what, what's he or she look like? How big is the family? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, the housing element provides a demographic profiles of the community, and we did mostly present um, community wide, city wide data, but I did want to comment that, again, if we were to dig down into some more demographic detail, it's taking apart the census information um, and seeing where we can get to more detail. The um, Again, what I've understood to be a significant policy directive of the council and um, the planning commission is that the middle income, as Mr. Dayton was just explaining, uh, the middle income portion of your community is not only just a workforce, but it's also uh, a portion of the community that um, actually pays a fair amount of taxes. Um, the lower income tax rates don't generate as much taxes. The middle, come, middle income part of your community could be a, a critical component of what makes the community work overall in terms of services and, and um, tax revenues. So um, we have a demographic in here, and I'm hoping somebody's going to tell me on what page, that, um, and demographic trends as well, showing over decades here. So we're on... Page 239. I'd, I'd like to turn to that information instead of off the cuff here. Hold. So um, actually, I think it's 238, um, table 22. It's um, households by income. And so this is a cross-section of our community, both in the city, California, as well as the county comparisons. This is also information that we look at on an annual basis with um, HUD as well to establish the area median income. So what you can see is um, the area media income is $60,700. Um, so that is basically your, your moderate level income. Low incomes are below the median, and, and middle and higher are above. So the median income... Is that a family income or an individual income? This is for a family of four. Thank you. Right. So looking at this table, um, we have a range of 50000 to $75,000 annual income. That represents 20% of our community is right at the median income. Then the incomes above that um, that go into the middle income category um, are, let's see, I'll just do some quick math, um, 11 and 13, 24, 30 percent of the community in um, the middle income areas above that. So combining the moderate and the median, you have about 50 percent of the community in that range. And again, I think that is the range of um, how, what, what the goals are for the affordable housing program is to meet about 50% of our community. Workforce. Workforce housing. Not the capital A. 50% of our community is... Say median, median income to middle income, according to this table. So, um, I mean, I'm seeing folks, and I know them, that, that, that live in Ventura that pay, you know, a house $250,000 or whatever, less even what... These, I think, most units would ever cost here. They have a, a, a small garden and a front yard, two car garage, and a 45 minute commute to come here. I just don't see those folks saying, okay, I'm going to move into a box 
in Santa Barbara. It's going to cost me more money. It's going to save me time. But when I go home on the weekends, where am I going to go? Thoughts? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Hoskins, I think that that's a, a good point, and I think that that's a misperception that a lot of people have, that when we put in housing, all of a sudden we're going to draw people back. I think the... The the, um, the the disappointing reality is, is that once they go, they're, they're gone. People try to come back, and you hear the success stories, but pretty much they're gone. And so what we're talking about is as we grow incrementally, how do we also grow the, the, with the housing stock for the people who do come here and do de decide to try to make a go of it in this community where they can find a place where they can live here and work? So it's, it's really about as we grow, not pulling people who have already left back. Okay, that's fair. Um, although I'm not sure the same uh, values will apply to people that come here. You know, young couple, God, I love it. I bike all around town, town. Suddenly they got a baby. Psh, they're gone. Um, so either we're going to have childless couples, which, of course, we could have, but we'll have a lot of movement here. Right. I mean, I just am, uh, projecting into the future. Would you agree with that? I think that that's a reality. I think that we need to try to envision as a city how do we how do we house a workforce at any stage of life and not just uh, imagine that someone's going to be here for the endurance for their whole entire lives. What, what, but what but we're looking what we're up against is is that slow that slow erosion of that uh, employee base that lives here. So we have to we have to be inventive to figure out a way to keep some employees here. Madam uh, Mayor and yeah, Councilmember Hodges, another way to analyze your question is to pose your question in the reverse. What type of housing would be developed in the absence of policies to encourage rental housing and affordable housing? Um, that, that is what is being proposed here is um, on top of a base um, assumption. And the base assumptions, which we've analyzed starting way back a couple of years ago, is there's quite a bit of residential property and commercially zoned property that allows residential use in our community that over the next 20 years is likely to, to be redeveloped. Um, that's something we have to prove to the state, that we have the potential to see development in our community and redevelopment of property towards, you know, the end of upper of 2,000 to up to 4,000 4, dwelling units. Um, the type of housing that would be developed in the absence of these programs is straight market rate housing. So if the community and property owners are building straight market rate housing. What does that do to the equation in terms of the demographics of our community, the ability to have a, a vital community with workforce, and an ability to um, move somewhat freely around the town without a lot of traffic congestion in our local streets as well as on the freeway? So I think it's important to think about the equation. There are options. The, the status quo without incentive programs or the status quo combined with rental uh, incentive programs, and where does that bring you? In either end, we should be thinking about where the, the community goes without the programs as well as with the programs. Right. When we talk about incentives, you're talking about zoning incentives, essentially, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, under the Plan Santa Barbara proposal, proposal with all the overlays and the special grants, et cetera, what's the highest density that we would see? Well, maybe John should answer this, but my, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Councilman Hotchkiss, uh, what we're, again, you do need to look at all the different layers of the beast, if you will, with the, the base base density being the 12 dwelling units per acre. Then you look at the incentives on top of that for unit size, which takes you to 45 dwelling units per acre as the highest, right? Then you look at the community benefit projects, and those can go up to 60 dwelling units per acre, right? And then beyond that, uh, you have to look at it's what the state requires you do. So the state requires that you add 25% if you do, you know, all affordable housing 
Uh, and so that's not something that's with, really within our control. That's what the state requires that. And they also require that you, you know, give other incentives. It's not just density, but they require you give setback density, uh, parking, and, and, and a lot of different types of incentives for affordable housing. And in fact, we have a, a whole handbook of affordable housing policies that deal with just those big A type affordable projects where you can get these higher densities like we've seen for uh, SROs and you know these transitional type of housing they're very unique again and again it's not one size fits all this is a very unique part of the community so you can get up to you know 128 dwelling units per acre but hey these are not single family homes you know these are single occupancy residents so so it's a different product type so it's not a it's not I mean, unfortunately it's not a simple answer it is it is a layered uh, I think you just gave me the answer 128 but but that's not a developer couldn't just come in and do that that it has to be you know all affordable and um, a developer typically isn't going to do that unless they're partnering um, with the RDA or it's the housing authority you know and we have I think the track record on that those type of developments has been stellar in terms of good product uh, you know that's compatible with the community and and, and helps to meet that that segment of well. our needs I got a feeling there are a lot of people out in the community that were watching television today and maybe sitting in the audience here that when you said 128, you know, grab their throat. And so um, my interest would be to be sure that we limit this uh, and that there are no quote unquote mistakes or whatever one wants to think that way. But it's just a comment so you understand. Thank you. Well, I want to I want to be perfectly clear about that, because, for example, Garden Court is 90 four units to the acre, I think, 94, 96 units to the acre. And no one would see that as some abominable building. So in order to get that high density that we're talking about, the units are extremely small, and they have community rooms and things like that. It's not uh, 94, you know, 1,200 square foot homes on top of a podium parking that's six feet high. That would never, never, never happen because... There's no way a, um, a building that would be completely affordable in that way would, would allow even for large units and that, that the whole point of the density is the small units. So, so just to be absolutely clear, so don't put out 128 units to the acre as a scare tactic. Let's be, be clear about what it is we're talking about. And I think the 60 units per acre even, that is extremely... The only way to get there is um, the 50% rental overlay in certain parts of town that includes a lot of the – it still needs to have findings of neighborhood compatibility and everything else. So I want to be perfectly clear about what we're talking about. Okay? Yes. Okay. May I, may I reply? You may. And Thank then you. I have some questions. I, I didn't want to scare anybody. I'm just trying to see, you know, you plan for the worst thing that never happens. So I think we need to – acknowledge what the worst could be, which I think is what the mayor was saying. Um, or the best. Yeah. Or the, or best. the best. Or the well, best. you ought to plan for the best, and the best might happen then. That's good. Um, I don't think the best is 128 units an acre, though. I'm not Garden sure where Court we're going here. Excellent example. Right, you need a going. place to live, so, um, and it gets but, you off okay, the street. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's, let's oh, wait, I got the floor here. You I know. Just, you got on. it. You have the floor, Mr. Hotchkiss, and then um, I'll have the floor. Fifty percent of the jobs in the city are in the retail or service industry, am I correct? I think we cited that as a figure. In... Where do these people live now? Do we know? Again, I, I don't know, but I think we have a, a table in the housing element that will help us there. Okay. But my... My understanding is is that many of those people live in our community okay. and that a, a, a certain percentage of them commute. Just like in, in all um, job sectors, we have, I think, a, a combination of local residents filling jobs as well as commuters. This, this may be another way of asking the same question. Only, I think, for the figures that you cited, only 36% of the jobs in the city are filled by residents, I came up with at one point that you cited. So the question is there, obviously, where do the remaining 64% live? Do we, do we have any idea? I mean, is it Lompoc? Is it Santa Maria? Is it... Uh, 
We, I have some statistics based on the model uh, for downtown alone, which would be the downtown core, which would be the area bounded by the freeway along the west and the south, and approximately Mitchell Trena to the north, and approximately Garden to the east. Okay, central downtown. Core. The central downtown, and, and what we found out is it, it, there's approximately 30 percent now uh, who employees within that area that come from outside of the model area, which would be uh, beyond 154. Well, it would be pretty hard not to come from outside that area. I mean, that's a pretty small area, right? Yeah, but conversely, what we found, which was very interesting, is that if you live within that same area, only 10% come from outside of the model area. Uh, excuse me, work outside the model area. So if you, li so if you live within that area... Right. Only only ten percent travel outside the model area to work. I see that larger area you're talking right. about. Right. So that's what that's the kind of the statistic that the model relies on. That is, if we put housing in that area, and of course it has to be the right type. It can't be the the housing that we've prim market rate housing we primarily put in, in in the last decade. It can't be that type. But if you put that type in a, uh, that is there now you can expect the same results in terms of where they will work, and that's why the traffic numbers work the way they do. Okay. Um, um, Madam Mayor, yes. I do want to, Councilmember Hotchkiss, again, refer to two tables on page 235 of the housing element, and um, one table, <clears throat> 19, is uh, related to city residents. Uh, the table above 18 also has Santa Barbara County. I just want to note that I believe it's been the city's position that we have a regional housing market, um, that employees that live in Carpinteria, Goleta, and places in between are part of our, our community. Um, but the numbers that you'll see on this table, um, 19, is just city residents. Um, but to answer your question, for example, retail trade, Based on this information, approximately 9% of the retail trade employees live in the actual city limits. I don't have the number for the South Coast area where I do think obviously that number would go up, probably double at least. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Okay, I have a few questions, then we're going to go to public comment. Uh, just to follow up a little bit about the jobs housing data, I guess um, it might be worth, and, and Coles, you can just nod your head, Debbie, but do you still do your annual survey to workers? Because, okay, the last one was 2008. So perhaps as we get that information, you can, because it's not just the downtown organization that's mostly retail. We're talking a whole variety of types of um, um, employment, and, I, and just from my past experience in my role as a human resources professional, uh, that was a really valuable tool in looking to see in my colleagues in the HR world uh, of, of why people live and work either in the same place or commute, and would they be willing, how far are they willing to commute to come to still work in Santa Barbara, or how far, you know, what is it going to take for them to actually leave Santa Barbara um, in order to find another job elsewhere, because the commute's just getting too much for them. And there's a lot of good info there, and I would suggest looking at that. Um, because I think, I think in terms of getting back to some of the questions, it's a balancing act of how big a house do you want and what amenities in your home versus the commute and the family life and being able to contribute to the place where you live. And if you're spending a third of your time working and commuting and another part of your time at home with your family members, that, that, does, that creates other issues for families too. And, so, and I think those surveys are actually very helpful and, and a wide variety of uh, employment types as well. So that would be good information to have. Also on the affordable housing percentages in other cities that was asked for, I think it would be helpful to include, if you're going to include which city, what the area median, in, uh, um, the area median income for that city, if you have it, but more importantly, actually, the uh, median housing price for that city. Because I think the high cost of housing in this city, which is much, much higher than most cities in California, will relate to why we have such um, a relatively high percentage of affordable housing. Um, so just to put it in context there would be helpful since you're going to put that info together. Anyway, um, first other question. Way back in the neighborhood preservation ordinance days um, when we were looking at single family 
uh, single family zones only really when we put that all together. A lot of conversations was talking about what about the R3 and R4 and, neighbor, and, and sort of an MPO type of design guidelines and things like that. And you talked about it very briefly in your presentation about a compatibility piece where, you know, a cottage-like house would be in the front of the property with the units in the back and it allows for the density. But we still don't have really a, like a design guidelines the same way as we do with the Neighborhood Preservation Ordinance for, for multifamily uses. So my question is, um, is that in here somewhere? Is, is along the lines of uh, the y priority yes, thing? The simple okay. answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. In the housing element yeah. piece to it? Okay, because that I think is, I just wanted to make sure because I know, and I see Joan Livingston actually in the back, and that was a conversation from like six years ago moving forward was, uh, was a big topic. that Developed design guidelines for the multifamily okay. um, neighborhoods. Which would then balance out the issue about density with neighborhood compatibility in the small town feel in, in, in more densely populated parts of the city. Okay, so that's, that's good. Can you... The rental overlay, can you help me, dis the, there, there are two options with the density, there's density option one and density option two. How does then that relate to the rental overlay? Can you put either option of the rental overlays with both density options or does, can you only put the second rental housing overlay option with option two of the density? See where I'm going? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, the idea is that you can mix and match these, and in some ways you can effectively get the same results by approaching it in a different way. So, so if we could have density option two, as Mr. White was suggesting, and the larger right. um, rental housing overlay, yes. we could do that. We could have, that? yeah, so you would have this together with this. We could do that. Yeah, so what that would mean is, as I understand it, that the density option two would limit the density of for sale residential in the way that was presented, but still allow for a 50 percent um, uh, overlay for rental projects in the area where we, re we took it out of the density option, option one, but for rental projects only. That's is correct. That, is that what we're saying? Let me say that again. So. So in density option two that the council member White put together, we took out the west downtown, the extra density piece in west downtown, but we're talking about for sale product only. But it doesn't, but it also, but it, it, so, okay, so that's for sale, but it still allows us to have the larger rental overlay of 50%. Right. So but here, it's based on the lower density. Right. So here on option two, you, if you look at this, this is the area in question. That shows at 15 to 25. Okay. okay so that's the, that would be the base. And then you would have this overlay on it that would add 50% 50, 50 increase for that same area. So 15 for this, to 25, not the... I'm sorry. A 50% overlay for this area that would now be at 15 to 25, but would only apply for rentals. It wouldn't apply for market. Okay. So that would bump you up, take you closer to that 40, 45 range. Okay. So that may help some of the concerns for rental issues, not necessarily for some of the condo projects that we were talking about in other areas. Okay. That's just answered right. that. Right. If your and focus then, is rental. And then finally, about the issue related to why are we looking at density in the area that's most expensive in the city. Um, can you, and maybe when the planning commissioners, when they come up and speak too, I guess the question is, well, if not there, where? I mean, we're not talking about increasing density significantly in San Roque. I mean, the whole city would be in here saying that, right, or, or in San Marcan. So, you know, so I'm assuming in order to get to where we got, we had to look at the non-negotiables and what, see what was left. And... Am I, am I assuming, is that right in terms of the process the Planning Commission looked at when we looked at density, or is it just sort of historical trends? Or it, it, It's actually, um, there's a lot of factors that play into that um, as to, if you look at it, kind of a bigger context of what we're planning for over the next 20 years, we're looking at, you know, Plan Santa Barbara is around 2,800 units maybe with the Planning Commission that bumps it up slightly above that. But in the big picture of, you know, all the residential we already have, 50% of it is single family um, that wouldn't be affected at all. Over the 20, next 20 years, it's only a 
percent incremental change. So we're not talking a, about a lot of housing here. That's that's the first point. Can you say that again? <laughs> no, I mean really. Can you can you say that just so I, I get it? We're talking. I mean, just to put the scope of what we're talking about here. Do you remember we what you have just something said? I believe close to uh, uh, thirty-nine to forty thousand units in the in the city today. Fifty percent of which are single family. None of that is proposed to be changed. I mean, there's been some discussion of relaxing standards on single family, but there's not a lot of consensus on that one. And that one's kind of been. Um, I hate to say shelved, but it, it's you know that that's going to take on another process in itself. It's not being it's not on the table right now. So really, you're looking at well over the next 20 years. Then how do we accommodate this range of growth that the community is is comfortable with? You know that was one of the first questions we ask in in growth management. How much non-residential? How much residential? So you look at this amount of, of 28 to 3,000, and and where where is the most appropriate place to put it? So you start looking at all the factors. Well, where are the opportunity sites? And that's where we had that uh, map with all the blue boxes. And you and and most of them are in the, the downtown area and the commercial areas. These are the areas that have low uh, value assessed values. They're one story. They're ripe. You know, so that that's quote opportunity areas. And again, this this is a lot of what the housing. Uh, HCD, the, the state asks us to do for the housing element. So we go through a lot of that process, you know, in part to meet the, uh, those requirements, but also because it's legitimate and we need to know where the most appropriate place is. Then we run a traffic model. The traffic model tells us, hey, you know, you put housing in the downtown, it's not going to have an effect on your congestion and, hey, it might even have a, a positive impact, but we play it really conservative. We don't factor that into the model just so that it, it's um, uh, unreproachable, if you will. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. And then there's the whole issue of, you know, the sustainability issue and wanting to have it the most walkable kind of community and address that 5% of people, you know. Well, maybe they won't be, you know, the, uh, the uh, traditional family with three kids, but hey, you know, we're kind of getting away from the traditional family. We got 50% of our housing meets the traditional family, but our demographics are telling us the traditional family isn't so prevalent anymore. We're seeing smaller families, and maybe that 5% is either smaller families or singles that during just that period of their life, and maybe they decide, oh, yeah, I do want to have three kids. Well, then... That, that's half of the city would accommodate that's when they go to the, the traditional family model to San Rocchio and and we have a lot of baby boomers that are like oh we're retiring I don't want to live up on the, the Riviera anymore I would love to live downtown where I could walk to everything so you know so that that five percent is if you put it in the context it's not a whole heck of a lot of our our housing stock and it, it's it's designed to meet a very specific um, uh, niche if you will and I think uh, Councilperson Hotchkiss is right. It doesn't. It's not designed for you know the classic traditional single-family homeowner. And but again, it's not going to. You're not going to see a whole heck of a lot of it. You know. But we. The idea is you want to have the densities available so that you can get that workforce in that you're trying to address. You know. And you'll have. We have safeguards to make sure that this isn't going through the roof, and we're not going to see ten thousand units built. You know, because of the density. Uh, and we can we can control that and then uh, great thank you very much okay we're going to move to public comment I see a number of planning commissioners here I want to give you the opportunity to speak first if you'd like and I know Bruce Bartlett and Sheila Lodge wrote speaker slips I don't know if Mr. Jostis or Mr. Jordan would also like to say a few words um, thank you oh there's Mr. Jostis's and then so Bruce why don't you come on up excuse me Chair Bartlett and then uh, followed by Sheila Lodge. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council members. Uh, if I'm limited to two minutes, I'm probably in trouble. But uh, well, there, we'll, there's so as much chair, here. We'll give you a little. I mean, extra. I would I would like to break it down maybe into just like three categories. One to respond on the form-based code question, uh, just briefly, and then maybe talk about density, and then just a tiny bit on on process, if I could. Uh, in terms of the form-based coding, uh, I did attend seminars. Uh, with Ms. Weiss and uh, fellow Commissioner Charmaine Jacobs in Ventura. And essentially the, the form-based code idea is the reverse of traditional uh, 
codes, it really focuses on what is, if you think of the buildings as being your box, it focuses on what's outside the box. Traditional codes focus on what's in the box, what your limits are, what you can do. The purpose of a form-based code is to design the public realm, the space between buildings, your streets, your setbacks, and really address block by block or in series of blocks as the the city fabric changes to know what what are the unique attributes of that neighborhood that you want to protect you be be it historic resources views sunlight all all the other things that we cherish about the public realm so it really it's designing the space that the public occupies as opposed to being a restriction on what goes inside of a building. So it's it's a more proactive approach and it's really grounded on what you have in your community and it's it's a goal of what we would love to get to in the future, but obviously it's a time consuming and more expensive way to go, but that's why it's in there as a goal in Plan Santa Barbara to work our way toward that. And I know uh, in our AIA meetings, we have uh, spoken about the concept, and I know AIA would step up to the plate, and we could incrementally start creating, you know, three-dimensional models of all the different blocks in town as projects come along, and it's, it's where you start building the database that you can work from, and that's what Ventura has done. They have a complete 3D model of the whole downtown, so when you propose a project, you insert your project into the context of that neighborhood and everybody can clearly see how it fits into the community fabric. The other goal of the form-based code is to not only design the public realm, but it talks about the face of the box and how it might set back so that you can get sunlight to your street areas, where you would want to have open spaces, how porous is the ground floor of the buildings, in other words, with windows, so that you prevent a big box store from coming in and just putting a blank wall on your sidewalk and having the, the windows to the back parking lot, more of a suburban style. So it addresses a lot of those attributes, and it allows you to have a more, more of a lifetime community where you have neighborhoods that have shops and commercial on the main street and it, as it turns the corner it transitions into maybe mixed use and starting in the next block maybe you have multifamily apartments which break down then into duplexes or uh, single-family homes that have granny units and then single-family homes so that within your neighborhood you're not forced to leave your neighborhood as you age or your life uh, situation changes so you keep your friends and you keep your roots but you can move around within the context of your neighborhood so that's really the goal of of form-based coding and it's not some strange myth it's really it's how we designed our communities before we had um, land use codes where we restricted areas of town for this land use or another land and you separated every use this is how you put them together and make them work together so that's my overview on form-based codes. Uh, to roll that into density with sort of a similar analogy, density I think is misleading when you think of it in terms of a number, like number of units, because, you know, as uh, Council Member Hotchkiss, you know, throws out the number of 128 and everybody is stunned, but really density is sort of the how, do you, how you uh, substantiate what goes inside of the box. Is it does it really have substance, or is it fluffy and air-like? And you know, I you know, as an analogy, you can have uh, you know, like if you go to the fair, you can have cotton candy, or you can have a candied apple. One's big and fluffy and has a lot of mass or bulk, if you will, but it's not very dense. And the the apple has something really good inside, and, and you know, it's much smaller. But if you count count them, uh, the numbers might scare you. So. I think density, when we're talking about building smaller units, you can't just base it on the unit count or how many keys do you have to get inside your box. Because what we're proposing with Plan Santa Barbara is that the entire box is shrinking and we're trying to put a better ingredient inside. And there, those are smaller units, less parking. So if you want to characterize it as an increase in density, it's really misleading because in all these scenarios, we're really trying to shrink the box, which is truly the public perception. So we're trying to create a public good by doing small units. So let's not get too hung up on the numbers because I think it's a, a, a disservice. Uh, and then to speak briefly about the land use map and the options in front of you, uh, the Planning Commission prefers the map that you see 
uh, right now, which has the higher density in the sort of west of state R3, R4 zone. What's proposed in option two at the 15 to 25 dwelling units break, or you can look at that entire chart, that breaks down to an FAR of 0.45. Well, guess what? 0.45 is the same density that you get for a 6,000 square foot single family lot on the Mesa. So if you want to apply a single family Mesa development density for our R3, R4 adjacent to commercial, we're wasting our land. Our land is a resource and this is the more affordable land that's close to downtown where the workforce wants to live. And to put that low of a base density on it, I, I think is it's the opposite of an incentive. It's a disincentive. Right now, you could build much more, and even in this environment, we can't get people to build there. So by reducing it even further, I think it's going to backfire. So we need the higher base density in the R3, R4. I think it also needs to be included within the rental overlay zone. Uh, if you don't include the rental overlay zone in that area, we talk about reducing parking for units down to one. Well, in option two, the only place you're talking about putting your units essentially is in the central business district that already exists, which already has one car. So it is no benefit. We're getting nothing out of that. So we need to extend it to the R3, R4 zone. And then to speak briefly just about the process, We've been at this a long time at Planning Commission, and so has the public, and I know a lot of you have been engaged as well. And it really started out with divided camps and everybody talking about what they don't want, what they don't like. And it's taken us five years to get to the point of everybody leaving that baggage behind and talk about what we have in common. And I think you got a taste of that at our joint meeting, and I hope that we can grasp the moment and keep moving that forward and focus what we want for the future. And I know listening to a lot of the questions, everybody wants proof and data on the future before we can have one, and that, that isn't right. There is no proof for the future. It's a direction. We need to trust ourselves. That's why Plan Santa Barbara actually has a steering wheel on it. We can maneuver it, but we have to trust ourselves to do that. And I'd be happy to talk with any of you about items, but I, I hate to see data and minutia get in the way of doing any of the choices would be better than where we're at now, and that's, that's my issue, I think, with the, with the process. I see Plan Santa Barbara as one giant community benefit project, and if we can't get a supermajority vote here at City Council for Plan Santa Barbara, there will be no community benefit projects. I mean, if we can't... Plan Santa Barbara is such a good thing, I can't believe we're arguing over how long do we want to put it off and are we really going to do it, but... What Planning Commission did, we didn't walk in with preconceptions. We asked for the EIR to study four alternatives to bracket the full range of discussion so that we could get true information to base our judgments. Only after having that did we formulate the hybrid. So what we're asking you is to work with what we have given you. Let's craft the last the fifth alternative, which will be our hybrid, let's run it through the EIR process and understand what all the ramifications are, good and bad, and then make our decision. But to sit here now with preconceptions and, and sabotage the process does nobody any good. And what's, what's frustrating about this is, is that it takes five votes to get something that's good for the community, but it only takes three to just sort of keep everything that we don't like about what we have now. And that doesn't seem democratic to me. And I'm really worried about the whole supermajority issue, not only just in getting Plan Santa Barbara, but for projects in general. I mean, we need we need to work together and not make it so divisive. But Well, thank you very much. I and, and look I... forward to the rest of your discussion. And I, I, I will take up, you know, any offers if anybody wants to meet on this. I mean, I have a long history and... I'd be happy to share, and, and I, I just want to move it along for I the community. I appreciate that. I think we, we have on our agenda next Tuesday to do our final direction, so that's not something we have to worry about right here and now in the next right. 45 minutes, right. which is good. It's a lot to learn, so, and I'm willing to help however I can. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. So just want to get the other planning commissioners out, Sheila Lodge and John Justice, and then I don't know, if Mr. Jordan, if you'd like to speak or not. No? Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
um, members of the council, I'd like to expand on the comments that I made last Tuesday evening, which aroused some interest in some of the council members, and which ties in very much with the discussion that has happened so far. Um, as I said, I think the city look, needs to look at additional ways of reducing the job creation potential in the city. And we um, have not, um, we, we just, there seems to be more than enough commercial land, land zoned for commercial purposes, and although many of the store vacancies are getting filled as rents have come down significantly, uh, there still is more than we need, and as people do more and more internet shopping, uh, real stores on the ground uh, are not, not as necessary, and so we don't need as much commercial zoning. I, and we're trying to juggle this jobs housing balance. Rezoning to co uh, commercial land to R3 or R4 was not something that was considered in the EI, draft EIR or the general plan update, the draft. Uh, however, I don't see any impediment in the council adopting a policy of all residential development on commercial lots and achieving, providing an incentive with increased densities for that. Um, I know developers sometimes come in with mixed-use projects, um, even if they don't necessarily want mixed-use, but they, they want the mixed-use setbacks. Uh, I think it's very important to maintain the R3 setbacks for livability, and there's been some discussion about that. Um, since residential uses generate less traffic than commercial uses, uh, one-tenth uh, of commercial and sometimes even less, depending on what the commercial is, there would be a greatly beneficial impact on traffic impact on traffic as well as the benefit of additional housing. There would be a real reduction on the job side because that land would not then there would be some jobs that come with additional housing, but not anywhere as much as would come with additional commercial development. Uh, however, for this to work and to provide a real a significant incentive to get builders to want to do this, um, the zoning, I believe, needs to, the density needs to say, stay the same as it is. Then you can add, if you upzone it, as is proposed um, by the, the Planning Commission recommendation, the land values are going to go up and it's going to get hard, harder to make affordable, create for affordable housing. Um, a, a really significantly increased residential Increased density for residential projects would be an excellent tool for the city to have. Uh, and, and you could really focus in on what the, what the community needs in workforce or moderate income for sale housing as well as the rental. And if you stick with the existing density, you, the, it could be way more than the 50% and, you know, get to the 60 units per acre or whatever it takes it, or to create this kind of housing as market housing. Um, and, and we do have a, an issue, as has been discussed also, with the end of the, the significant funding the Redevelopment Agency has been able to provide. This also might serve as a compromise between those who do not want to see increased density and those who are anxious to increased housing and improve the jobs housing balance. So I uh, hope you will consider this as another alternative. Thank you. Thank you. John Jostis, and then we'll start with the rest of the public. At Susan Klein Rothschild will be first. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Good members of council. Uh, I'll try to be brief, and I'm, I may miss some things because I was not able to uh, observe le earlier uh, meeting this week. But uh, from my perspective, I, I want to build on what uh, Chairman Bartlett said. Uh, this, I think it's really important to remember that the decision before you is a policy decision. It's not a development or a design decision. It's a, policy, it's a big picture decision about what the city wants to do differently and what it wants to do differently about the last increment, the, la the next 10% of our build-out. So we are not building a new city um, from scratch. This is kind of uh, our, our, our senior moment here for, for the city's build-out. And I think um, the, um, 
rather than trying to have all of the details in place, I think you really have to go back to what's happened over the past five years. And I've, I've spent as much time as anybody trying to get this plan to a point where you folks could approve it. And we came to you with a uh, five to one recommendation on a hybrid, which was, in my opinion, a very thoughtful compromise to try to make uh, the most out of uh, a very, very lengthy and very, very detailed planning process. Uh, what I'm troubled about is that the, the conversation sends a couple of messages to me that uh, there is not the confidence in your own boards and commissions to avoid getting into the weeds. Mm -hmm. And that, that's of concern to me because I serve in good faith and I want to do the best I can uh, to make this city have a good quality of life. And what we're trying to do is not to recreate the wheel, but rather to fine-tune and nudge our planning so that we have not a worse quality of life, which is where I think we're going with the status quo. And I think we need to think about the whole community and not just pieces of the community. As I've said from time to time, we've got to change it from me to we. Now, what concerns me is that you're not going to be able to come to a decision by the end of the year. What I hear in some of the discussion today are questions that are focusing on looking for reasons to say no, rather than looking for reasons to say yes. And that change in attitude is absolutely essential for you to get to the finish line before the end of the year. Because if you don't do that, if you can't come to agreement, I believe you will have squandered a, an incredible effort of the community in the time they have spent on this process, the staff and the commissioners and all the other boards who have weighed in on this thing. We've got a lot invested and we really want, I want you to make a decision and make a decision that is not perfect but good enough to get us to the next step. So please focus your efforts and your engagement on getting to the fork in the road and taking it and getting to yes. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll have two minutes up on the podium. Susan Klein Rothschild will be followed by Ann Patterson. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. As an employee of the Public Health Department and a member of the Com Coalition for Community Wellness, I want to thank you and commend you for considering health as a defined goal in this general plan. What you do in the design of this community will directly impact the health of all the residents. There are more than 50 scientific studies that show significant relationships between community design, physical activity, and obesity. Walking is directly related to obesity, and obesity is related to chronic illness. For every additional kilometer a day someone walks, that translates into a 4.8% reduction in the likelihood of being obese. How do you promote walk walkativity? Walking can be promoted through street connectivity. Also, the best distance for walkability is promoted by a half mile. The amount of retail destinations that people can walk to is the best, best method for reducing air pollution. Affordable housing can also promote walkability because when people have shorter distances to go for work, they increase their walking and decrease their driving. As a member of the Public Health Department, I want you to know we want to help the city when it gets time to implement the policies that you make the decision to do. We recognize it will impact the health of all residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ann Patterson, be followed by Fred Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Coalition for Community Wellness. The Coalition for Community Wellness represents key health agencies in, this, in the Santa Barbara community. We commend the city for including health as a defined goal in the new general plan. My coll colleagues from the Public Health de Department already commented on the importance of enhancing walkability as the city proceeds into the next decades. I'd like to comment on the critical importance of providing for affordable workforce housing in the general plan. When local affordable housing is available, workers decrease car travel. 
This is especially true for those who travel long distances to work, and such reductions in car travel will ultimately reduce air pollution and noise. This will positively impact the environment and the overall health of the people of Santa Barbara. In addition, when working families can afford to live near their jobs in the city, there are increased opportunities for them to use other forms of travel, such as walking and biking, which increases their individual physical activity and promotes health. Even if they don't walk or ride their bike to work, workers living in the city would be more, like, more able to conveniently take public transportation to and from work, again reducing the number of cars on the streets, especially during commute hours. Employers in Santa Barbara are keenly aware that lack of workforce housing is a major deterrent for qualified applicants from outside the area to accept employment here. And those who decide to commute from more, from more affordable areas spend long hours away from their families. As speaking from the health care community, we also need health care workers and emergency personnel available during emergencies, and I remember really well um, when I was working at the Public Health Department during the La Conchita slide, and so many um, health care providers and emergency personnel were basically blocked out of Santa Barbara. Um, so the Coalition for Community Wellness supports the language in the general plan that promotes policies that will improve the health of our residents through community design and location of resources. Can you wind up, please? Hmm? Can you wind I up, am. please? Thank you. <laughs> Providing workforce housing is another way to achieve improved health through community design. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fred Sweeney will be followed by Judy Arias. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, I hope I'm not talking. I'm, I'm going to follow up on Mr. Justice and Mr. Bartlett's comments about I'm hoping that we're moving towards a decision that um, we're not talking to the state legislature that we'll actually get to some conclusion. Uh, and I just want to talk on two points. One is uh, I certainly appreciate Mr. Ledbetter's comments about the issue of secondary units or granny units, which has been a big concern of the Upper East. Uh, I think we are close to where we need to be at this point. Uh, I would urge you, if you do chose to relax some of those requirements as you go through this process, that perhaps you don't have to apply it retroactively to the entire city. You may want to do it by neighborhood, and certainly the Upper East has expressed its position on that uh, element. The second piece is to encourage uh, when Mr. Bartlett shared with you about form-based planning. I think if, as a policy, you understand and accept that as a tool in the toolkit, it's going to be very, very important so that people begin to visualize what will happen to their community block by block. And a point might be made that it took us 30 years to get to a second ABR board that just reviews residential work. We probably needed that many, many years ago. It may take us just as long to use form-based planning as a tool as we move in the future because it's going to be a very big investment. It's a much harder way to plan a community, but I think the end result will allow all of us as citizens to clearly understand visually what's going to happen as our city continues to deal with change between what happens between the ocean, the mountains, and the two ends of the city, because we can only put so much stuff here. So I would encourage you to really think about that as you begin to adopt this process. Uh, the Upper East is very pleased to be a part of this process. We'll continue to participate. And uh, if you have any concerns or questions about our particular neighborhood, we'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you. Judy, Madam Mayor, could I ask a quick right question? Mr. Uh, with computerization now and CAD and all that, could form-based coding or whatever we call it not be done much more readily than actual for, uh, models? Yes, absolutely. The city of San Luis Obispo, through its relationship with Cal Poly State University, was actually able to obtain a grant, and they were able to put their entire downtown into that model. And I think Bruce just alluded to the fact that Ventura is doing the similar uh, activity. So that technology is available to us. Uh, how we acquire it and what the cost will be, that's probably something that would take effect once you adopt that policy. Thank you very much. I'm still waiting for the holodeck, but that's okay. Um, Judy Arias will be uh, followed by Beverly King. 
I'm representing Hidden Valley. We sent a letter to the planning staff, planning commission, and council requesting that Hidden Valley not be included with the secondary units, and we have never received a response back. Also, when the problem with the pods came up and being in residential areas, we were told it would be covered by the general plan, and we have heard nothing about that. Um, when Falcone was um, uh, on council, um, she mentioned the combining of lots and the effect for large massive buildings, the question of setbacks, open space, and things like this. I don't know if this has ever been covered, but it should be. Um, I think that the um, adaptive use should be very much uh, encouraged and increased because it is uh, a way of preserving the characters of our neighborhoods. Finally, I think it's very wise, as Councilman Elconi said, to get the facts and find out how things work with other cities before we jump into the pot. And the other thing is, I also think that you should look at our housing problems as a regional problem for other communities to step up to the batting cage. The heart of the matter is what type of housing and what will work to cut the commute. We've heard conflicting res responses about whether the commute will be affected or not affected. And the bottom line is the amount of money that people can pay for houses, the type of house they can get, and whether they have a family. And we all know there may be fewer children now, but that all goes cyclic, so you have to assume that there will be baby booms again. So all these information need to be put out before you make final decisions. And remember, the city does not have the power to tell you where you work, to make you take the bus, or to tell you that you can't own one car or 15 cars. So there has to be a balance in the decision-making process that you make. Thank you. Thank you. Beverly King will be followed by Connie Hanna. Madam Mayor, I'd like to give my time to Connie. Sure. So, Connie, I'll give you four minutes. Good morning. I'm Connie Hanna, speaking for the Santa Barbara League of Women Voters. During the past five years, many League members have been attending almost all of the city's hearings on Plan Santa Barbara, and we have consistently supported slow growth policies. Such policies have preserved the unique qualities that have been defining Santa Barbara for many years. We have repeatedly expressed our concern that the city seems to be heading toward a radical change in density and a much faster pace of growth. The hybrid plan before you would allow 45 to 60 units per acre, which is two or three times the amount that is now permitted, and it's a radical change in policy. Even using the 15 to 27 units per acre now allowed, plus bonus density, the city permitted the enormous Chapala One to be built. It now sits empty. We need to find a better way than that. If we keep the present density of 15 to 27 units per acre and add new policies like requiring smaller units and limiting height to three stories, we could permit buildings that would be much more attractive to everyone, more sellable, and more compatible with our downtown character. The League certainly does support increased density in some special circumstances, such as rental housing and subsidized affordable housing. I think in workshops we should be very careful not to compare housing authority subsidized housing projects with market rate projects which have totally different goals. The environmental impact report that you have just reviewed clearly shows that the lower growth alternative has less impact on almost every measurable city resource. Less growth requires fewer policemen, firemen, and service workers and will require much less water, energy, and waste disposal. The League 
of women voters asked the city council to change the draft plan before you to remove the high densities and maintain the present base density of 15 to 27 units per acre with sensible controls on it. We have long been concerned that the housing that we are proposing to build downtown because of the cost of the land will be too expensive for city workers to afford. That is what has always happened in the past, and we're afraid it would happen now. Thank you. Thank you. John Campanella is next, um, be followed by Callum DeForest. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. I uh, uh, just want to give my support to the Planning Commission recommendations that we've seen come through a, a very good discussion and vetting process, and the uh, very impressed by the uh, diversity and the number of groups that support it and have come out in support of their recommendations. Uh, just a couple of points I'd like to make, I think, is uh, if we're looking at 2,800 units or 3,000 units and we see difficulty in where to put them, I think when we have a spot to put them that makes sense, we should intensify that site. At 20 units an acre, that's 140 acres that would be needed to build out 2,800 units. Now, can we find that over 20 years? I, I don't think so. That's a lot of land that would have to be consumed. I think less burden on the community, more, efficiently, uh, more efficiency, and more sustainability can be achieved by when you have a site that can take 45 units an acre, you try to achieve it on that site where it works and eliminate twice the land needed to produce the same amount of units. Uh, just look, looking at Paseo Chapala quickly, just if we were doing apartments there, uh, effectively our 1,400 square foot units, even reduced to 1,000, uh, would produce about 40 units than 29. We currently about ha have uh, half of the units are 1,000 square feet. If we made them all 1,000 square feet, we'd have 40 units on the same floors. Our pricing would come down about 25%. For any uh, smaller units, or if some fourth floor element, if you, uh, you're allowing that for rentals, it could come down another 25% per unit, because not only are you doing smaller units, but you're also building them for less construction costs, just by inserting a floor, or half a floor, or a quarter of a floor, whatever you're doing to build up that fourth level. And that's going to be based upon design and location. I think that's a way to get the rental costs down and try to make them achievable. R3, R4 definitely needs a density so that 20 units per acre, two-story walk-ups can be converted to modern product, less energy consumptive product at three stories of living area, suitably placed so that we can get the rental numbers down there as well. And I would not overlook the car to over to Haley, connect the community. Uh, that's probably the lowest land base right now that there is in the city, and it's going to get lower because of the fact that commercial development is going to be restricted. You've got storage parcels and things like that that may not be able to build. You need to you wind can connect, up. You can connect those two areas both socially and economically. Thank you. Thank you, but Mr. White has a question for you. Thank you. Um, what would it take to take a Paseo Chapala and have it provide underground parking rather than above ground parking? Uh, as, there is probably around anywhere from 8 to 10 feet is the water table at that level. So, uh, and we're going downhill. There's about a four foot grade break as we go downhill from the uh, De La Guerra Street down towards the ocean. Uh, so you'd have to be down eight feet and try to get about 13 foot clearance for an underground parking garage and that wouldn't work in that, that particular location. Uh, as far as absolute, you know, there might be a partial in some locations, but still you have to keep your commercial property at grade, some, some areas in town. It really is based on the location, but I, it would not have worked at Paseo Chapala. Because of the, the physical aspects of the site? The physical aspects of the site. And the closer you get down towards the, uh, the water, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to get lower. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Thank you. Thank you. Callum DeForest and then Brian Hoffer is giving your minutes to Mickey Flax. Mickey Flax will be next. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Callum DeForest, and I have some points, not in any particular order of urgency. Uh, point number one is that the El Pueblo Viejo district does not seem to be factored into the land use plan. Obviously, development in the uh, EPV would, will be 
restricted by its impact on the history and the buildings that already exist in that uh, district. Point number two is the plan has not, to, in my opinion, when talking about uh, units, especially in the West Beach area or elsewhere, is the number of vacation units. A resident of West of the West Beach uh, has told me that at least he estimates that at least 50 percent of all the units in in the West Beach area are vacation units, which does not provide, I mean, it provides income for Santa Barbara, but it certainly is not providing housing for anyone, for a permanent housing for anyone, just for the citizens of Bakersfield. As to rental units, has any census been taken of how many rentals are provided in the older houses in that in Santa Barbara that rent out rooms or have been split into apartments, I know a number there are a number of those I don't know whether they've been counted in uh, and you do need to start winding up or wind up the uh, then I would be very interesting to know who is buying the single family houses that become available due to uh, uh, retirement or I mean or downsizing of so I haven't seen no are those people are those vacation houses or okay uh, part-time need to wind up mr. DeForest. the uh, other thing I support the farm-based form-based code, and I would like to see that Pearl Chase's aesthetic vision for the design of the city is what, what has made Santa Barbara the unique community it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mickey Flax will be followed by Paul Hernandi. We'll put four minutes up for you. Uh, first, I'd like to offer, um, I believe that we I'm Mickey Flax uh, speaking. Uh, I'm on the co-chair of SB for All, and you have our letter, but today I'm really speaking for myself. Uh, but I'd like to offer, I think you all have this, but if you don't, this was our brochure at the beginning or towards the beginning of the Plant Santa Barbara process, and it has what I think is an excellent description of form-based coding um, and definition of what it is and how it would work. And I, in case you've lost it, I'd like to present this to Michael Self. Thank you. Um, I, too, want to talk about reality. Uh, reality checks are important, and I'd like to talk about that. I want to respond to some of uh, Council Member Francisco's questions. Um, in terms of cities, Portland, Oregon, which is somewhat larger than we are, but not that much, um, has downtown housing. Uh, I visited the, the uh, um, subsidized housing there, as well as uh, subsequent development of market rate, both rental and ownership housing in the downtown of Portland. Portland also has a unique uh, transportation system of buses, street railways, and bike paths. And uh, we stayed at a downtown hotel for convention there. I can tell you there was no traffic congestion during the week, but there was on the weekend. On the weekend, people from the suburbs come in for all of the cultural amenities that the downtown has to offer, and that's when there was congestion. But on a daily basis, the system works. People live downtown, they walk, people take mass transit, people take bicycles. Um, and I think that's true generally. I want to refer to uh, an article in the LA Times from uh, May of this year, which talks about a development in Santa Monica of 165 units, uh, which has been filled since it opened late in 2008. Uh, it has small units. Uh, 
the, uh, the, the some of them are. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the. They're they're very small. They're uh, 350 square feet, most of them, uh, and they are full. The smaller units, the article says, make sense where the cost of land is high and there is an abundance of jobs and commerce. That means people want to live there but may not be able to afford the rents that traditional larger apartments fetch. Uh, the, the median size of a U.S. home was 900 square feet in the 1950s. Most of us grew up in homes of around that size. Uh, we seem to have done okay. We're not criminals, we're not crazy. Uh, some of us have had to lose some weight, and maybe that was part of it, I don't know. Um, uh, in, the, in 2007, that grew to 2277 square feet, almost triple in size. But since then, it has begun edging down due to developments like this one in Santa Monica, and it's now 2,161 square feet in the first quarter of this year. So it is true that, um, that housing is getting smaller and that people want it. The, the development in Santa Monica has been rented, and it's set, uh, some of them are set for uh, people uh, below the local median of $55,000, but the rest are uh, open to all. And yet the residents pay 30% less than other new apartments in Santa Monica. Um, someone from the Urban Land Institute said, as the price of housing rises faster than incomes for many people... I need to wind you, up. And, but Mr. Hotchkiss has a question, so if you could wind up and then... Okay. Uh, right through your four minutes. You will see this being a small but steady growing part of the market. How do you make units affordable to people in the middle income workforce if they want to live in the city? And I think this hybrid plan does do that. If we don't want those people to live in the city, if we say we don't care about the middle class, and a regional impact of growth study that I participated in showed that we are losing the middle class from the city and from the region, if we want to do that, let's just continue the way we are. But if we want to maintain the traditional balance of lower income, middle income, as well as upper income, we have to take steps to do that. Okay, you need to wind uh, up. What, no, what? You really, you're at five minutes, so um, uh, I gave you four, an extra minute. Okay, Mr. Well, Hodges most of does have a quoted. question for Ms. you. Ms. Flex. Yes. Thank you. Does it in that article say uh, give a profile of who those renters yes. are? Say, could you yes, just gives, briefly do it briefly? It gives two. One is a um, a graphic designer who is 40 years old, and he lives in 350 square feet. He says everything is within three steps of the next thing in the house. Okay, and he's he likes one. That. Does it have an overall? It doesn't have an overall, okay, but, it, that's needed. Thank but, you. but it also quotes a massage therapist who shares the studio with her high school aged daughter, and she says, I was like, wow, everything is new and working. I can stay off the freeway and walk to the grocery store. And that is exactly what we are trying to accomplish. And I think the that's hybrid nice. plan does that. Okay, thank you. Paul Hernandi? Paul's still here, yeah. Followed by Takashi Wada. Like, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'm Paul Hernadi, um, the South County Vice President of um, Citizens Planning Association, but I will speak uh, on my own behalf, however, pulling uh, out a couple of items from our many, many letters to you. Uh, um, the, uh, the number that was quoted that we are 90% uh, finished with our development, so 10% remains, that doesn't seem quite right because uh, we have um, f about 40,000 uh, uh, dwelling units, and I think that the build, full build out mentioned something over 9,000, and that did not even take into account the 45. Uh, limit. So basically, it seems to me like uh, under current zoning, we can have another 25%. Uh, uh, and uh, that might appear to many of us a little too, too, 
too much. Uh, however, um, I am very much in favor, as Citizens Planning Association is, with, of the 2,800 uh, new units of Plan Santa Barbara, uh, much less so of the 4,400 units of uh, the additional housing uh, alternative, simply because uh, the 2,800 is 7% of the four. 40,000, and the 4,400 would be 11%. So I don't quite know how the 5% that uh, Mr. Ledbetter often mentions uh, comes from, but it seems like 7% in over 20 years would be the continuation of our current growth structure uh, trends and would be quite sufficient. The other thing, because I'm sure that I'm running seconds. out of time. You've got 13 seconds. Yep. Uh, where am I? Now? 10 seconds. Ten seconds. Well, that won't quite work, but I will just mention that uh, we are very much in favor of healthy living, but walkability is one thing. The air you breathe while you walk is another. And when the, uh, when the uh, uh, California Air Resources Board demands uh, uh, 500 feet distance from freeways and our uh, Plan Santa Barbara tries to reduce that to 250 and even that just tentatively, there seems to be something wrong. Okay. Also, you need to wind that up. Also, I hope somebody will ask me about setbacks because then I could explain what our position is on that. But uh, failing that, I just think that, uh, that uh, residential uh, units should have residential setbacks whether they are in a mixed use setting or not. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Takashi Wada will be followed by Debbie Cox Bolton. Welcome to Santa Barbara, Thank officially you. from the dais, our new public health director for the county. So, right. Mayor, City Council, good morning. I'm Takashi Wada, director of the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department. Uh, we commend the City of Santa Barbara for considering health as a defined goal in the general plan as it provides a unique opportunity to impact quality of life here in the city. Too often, the debate on health care focuses on insurance, access to doctors and clinics and hospitals, high-tech tests, and the latest and greatest medicines. All of this is important, but we need to also recognize that it's equally important to prevent illness and promote wellness, and how cities are designed plays a vital role in this area. Scientific research reveals that many things influence health, but our lifestyle and habits have the largest impact on our health status. Most preventable health problems, including about half of premature deaths, are caused by lifestyle factors such as tobacco, alcohol, drug use, our diet, lack of physical activity, obesity, and unsafe sexual activity. While there is obviously a personal responsibility and individual behavior aspect to these factors, cities and policymakers can promote and facilitate the health of their residents by providing healthy environments and opportunities for people to make better choices by doing things like developing streets that are safe for all users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, bus riders, children, and people with disabilities to promote physical activity and reduce automobile use promoting new grocery stores with fresh fruits and vegetables in underserved communities, examining current zoning codes and policies to increase opportunities for physical activity and access to healthy food and decrease access to tobacco products, identifying uh, land that could be made available for community gardening, reviewing existing vending machine contracts and eliminating unhealthy snacks and sugar-sweetened beverages, encouraging community centers, programs, and restaurants to serve healthy foods, recommending obesity prevention resolutions to promote obesity prevention policies, and creating healthy food zones around schools by regulating the location and density of fast food restaurants. These are just some specific examples of what you can do, but there are many ways to implement the policies incorporated in the general plan. The Public Health Department looks forward to working with the city in the coming months and years and to improve the health of everyone that lives, works, plays, and prays in the great city of Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wada. Debbie Cox Bolton will be followed by Joe Andrelitis. Madam Mayor, Council, thank you. My name is Debbie Cox Bolton. I'm with the Coastal Housing Coalition. We represent employers and employees on the South Coast. And just to respond to your request, we will. Um, we uh, normally look at our employee surveys by South Coast, so I will try to, um, to bring out that uh, data both by the city and downtown if Thank possible you. and get that to you. Uh, but we've been involved in the plan Santa Barbara throughout the process, making the case that 
um, densities and other th topics you're discussing are of key importance to employers uh, and employees. A uh, recent workforce investment study indicated that even in this economy, the top concern cited by county, worker, work, county employers was retaining and recruiting employees. Uh, this underscores the conversation that you were having with Mr. Dayton about who lives here and who we're trying to serve. And I'd like to echo what he said about thinking about the future. Uh, 20 years ago, Santa Barbara was quite a different place. If this is a document that's supposed to last us 20 years. Looking backwards might help inform looking forwards. 20 years ago, the median home price on the South Coast was $295,000, and the median income was 57 or so. Fast forward 20 years and you're looking at home prices spiking at $1.2 million, back down to about $700,000, still an increase of 137 percent. And the median home price is 860, uh, eight, eight, now on the south coast about $86,000. In other words, home prices have risen nearly three times as fast as incomes. And not surprisingly then, over 30 years, uh, in 1980 we had less than 5,000 commuters and now we're looking at 30,000 daily commuters into the south coast, admittedly not just to Santa Barbara. So while the population had stayed, uh, the city of Santa Barbara stayed relatively flat, about 5 percent. In its introduction, uh, the JAF general plan draws the conclusion based on this economic and demographic data that Santa Barbara is becoming even more of a retirement and vacation community, losing its families with children, I'm quoting, as well as its resident workforce in their prime years, while being replaced by predominantly single males working in the tour tourism industry services and real retail positions. So in short, the decisions that are going to be made in this general plan update can either continue the path we're on or can address some of those concerns that have risen over the last 20 years. Um, and and the, we think that the Planning Commission's um, hybrid approach really does, uh, that's focused on workforce housing for the little a, not subsidized housing, um, is the right approach and the specific tools that they um, that they've recommended are, are the right ones, including employer-sponsored housing, which we hope does include uh, owner employees okay. sponsored housing. Thank you. You do need. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Joe Angelitis will be followed by Mil Tess, and the final speaker will be Leanne French. Good morning. I have a little handout to pass out real quick. So, this is um, John asked you for this data. If you can pass it to the city council members. Um, John asked you for this data. Um, yesterday, and I failed to give it to him, so I'm going to present it myself this morning. Um, he asked um, me to do a little case study on one of our projects on De La Guerra Street. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I'm more than happy to take you through it. There's still five units available for sale. Um, <laughs> they're not my units, but um, it's our client's units. Um, it's a great project, well received by Planning Commission and uh, ABR and Landmarks. Um, what I did was just run through a couple scenarios. The existing project is 27 dwelling units per acre, 14 units at an average unit size of 1,266 12, square feet. I'd like you to focus on the two um, scenarios that are in red. Um, and, and what I'm trying to do here is just kind of debunk the myth on this, this density you know, argument. Um, if you look at the mass of that project as you see it right now, without it changing, if you reduce the unit size, average unit size to 1,000 square feet, you can increase the density to 45, unit dwell 45 dwelling units per acre. Just what you see right there, nothing changed, just like it is. And that's with one and a half spaces per unit. Now, if you were to look at the revised scenario, which I showed at the bottom, where you just do one space per unit, you can actually increase the density to 40, 54 dwelling units per acre. So if you, that half space per unit, you get a 20% hit on your density. Um, and then the other thing we were touting on, on these scenarios is that the only way to get in the current um, um, density framework, you can only get to 45 unit dwelling units per acre if you go down to 600 square feet. So my scenario is I bumped that up to 1,000 square feet because I think it's more achievable. And as you can see on this project, and I'm, I, I, I could take you all there. It's a beautiful project. People love living there. You got it's, eight it seconds to well do it. Works well with the neighborhood and um, and all that. And the last thing I want to say is I don't know if you guys got this flyer from Allied Neighbor. Um, but I thought it was nice that they put the De La Guerra Adobe next to the Susky building. Well, with the current density that you're proposing in option two, you couldn't build De La Guerra Adobe in an R3 zone. So just consider that when you're looking at those densities. Mr. Hotchkiss has a question for you. Hi, the, your latest sale was like $1.2 million? On those units? Yeah. Um, possibly. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think they've been reduced. I don't know what the current 
asking prices. Yeah, I, think, I think they're around that. I mean, they're getting good prices. Miltas and then Leanne French. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Milt Hess, and I live on Los Olivos Street in the Upper East, and I just have a question. Um, the, one of the four key goals in the presentation was uh, to maintain the character of ex our existing uh, residential neighborhoods, and I, I really didn't hear anything specific about that, and I would simply like to know if there are some additional comments you could make about it. If you'd like, well, we're just about done, and maybe when we're done with public comment, they can comment on that. Okay. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Leanne French will be the final speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm Leanne French, representing CPA and the Executive Director. And um, you've received our numerous letters, and so I'm not going to repeat those. I just want to echo a couple of thoughts based on the information shared today. Um, the suggestion of the west downtown increasing in density, or west of the downtown be between the freeway, that there, there's two concerns about that is if, if we leave it at the 15 to 27 and do the rental overlay, we in, if, in effect get some increased density, but not overwhelmingly so. And I do want to echo Paul Hernati's concerns about pushing all that affordable, small a, housing right up against a freeway when we all know that there are health impacts to that. So just we need to be consi consider what the mitigation efforts would be to reduce the air particle uh, concerns in that case. The second thing I um, wanted to point out is that if we, if you make the decision to increase densities from 15 to 27, the current range, up to the 27 to 45, that's an upzoning effort. And there's an opportunity for, if you choose to do that, we're not necessarily supporting that, that perhaps that increased density could be used for another community good, such as a TDR program that would support preserving open space outside. So if we do have the increased density, we're also gaining the open space that the people could use to balance that effort. And lastly, I do um, hope that you consider the issues of a gentrifying community, that it's really important that we continue to promote um, families and, um, that, and small children in this community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes public comment. We were supposed to end at noon. It's a little after noon now. Um, staff, I think, I don't know if you have any specific quick comments or some questions and how maybe suggest how you want to proceed because I'm sure there's lots of comments, but I want to respect people's time. Just one real quick brief response to, to um, uh, supporting our neighborhoods. Um, in one sense, there's really no change being proposed with Plan Santa Barbara to the single-family neighborhoods. Maintaining the character is paramount. On the other hand, there, are, there is a planning effort uh, also uh, looking forward to uh, neighborhood planning and to make neighborhoods more walkable, and, but really adjusting that planning effort to the individual neighborhoods. So on the one hand, there's no immediate changes, that's for sure, with density increases or anything. Um, but in the future, there has um, been a lot of um, desire expressed by the community to look specifically at each neighborhood and, and how they could uh, improve that themselves, this bottom-up type neighborhood planning. So. So do we want to just table our discussion till Tuesday? I think that sounds about right. And I'm sure if there's any questions we want to give to staff in between now and then, um, you can. When you come back on Tuesday, are you going to give us some parameters? How, what, what is Tuesday going to look like? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I did want to make a comment about that. Uh, you'll be receiving a, a very brief council agenda report, I think, at the end of today. Um, and what we're saying there is that we're going to present for the council's consideration a uh, sort of a matrix or table approach to show you. Um, again, we'll, pro we'll outline the Planning Commission hybrid and there where we think your discussion may go. We're going to take the leap of faith of putting out there what could possibly be council adjustments to the Planning Commission hybrid. And I ask for your um, indulgence in doing that. Uh, the effort uh, is to help 
the, the conversation move along. I don't really presume to know where the council as a whole um, stands. Um, but with your indulgence, that's going to be our starting point with you on August 3rd. Okay. Thank you very much, and that was a great public comment as well, which you know gave us a chunk of the time. So I appreciate that, and this meeting's adjourned.